Well, that's why I'm enjoying this conversation so much and why I say I think you're, you're, you're very good at what you're doing because you're not entrenched in, in a materialist perspective. And you're very well acquainted with it, and, and but nor are you entrenched in a non-dual perspective. You're open to both, and, and that that makes for a very open conversation. You've made me say things that that I'm that I wasn't aware were, were inside me. So it, it's a beautiful conversation. Rupert Spira is one of the most highly requested guests on this channel, and he's a non-dualist teacher of the direct path, which is a method of spiritual self-inquiry. As often happens on this podcast, just when I think that a podcast, a previous podcast, cannot be topped, the guest surprises me, and Rupert Spira is no different. The conversation between him and I, at least I hope he feels it from my end, I definitely felt it from his. It's so loving and so smooth while touching on a confection of topics such as the nature of reality, what part of our consciousness is shared, what does it even mean to share consciousness, and fourth, which is a project that I'm extremely passionate about, that is, where is science going? What will science of the future look like? This is something that I, at least right now, call abichnosis, that is a fusing of both the East and the West's conception of knowledge. For those who are new to this channel, you should know that it's dedicated to exploring theoretical physics and consciousness, particularly around what are called theories of everything. Unlike most of my physics and mathematically oriented brethren, I don't have an aversion to what would be considered to be nonsense or woo. I have the feeling that if innovation is to occur, it's going to come or at least be heavily informed by the fringe, and the more we do not listen to it, the more we handicap ourselves. Luckily, Rupert Spira is an open-minded, perceptive, sagacious individual who through decades of internal investigation found gold and he's willing to share it. Whether you believe all of his model or not, there's practical advice and you'll likely find yourself pausing every 10 minutes or so to let what was thought-provokingly said sink in. It's intriguing because there are many truths, many, many, many truths that I found in my later years behind the doors that I said I previously would have classified as the insensate ramblings of those who don't wear shoes and who have strings of beads as doors. I'm a bit ashamed of my former obstinate, self-righteous, atheistic self and so partly these investigations into consciousness from a non-mathematical perspective is partly my admission that my worldview is so incomplete and I'm not willing to shut the door, at least not with the same intensity and arrogance that I used to, though I wouldn't call myself an atheist or a theist. There are two sponsors of today's podcast. Algo is an end-to-end -end supply chain optimization software with software that helps business users optimize sales and operations, planning to avoid stockouts, reduce returns and inventory write-downs, while reducing inventory investment. It's a supply chain AI that drives smart ROI, headed by a bright individual by the name of Amjad Hussein, who's been a huge supporter of the podcast from its early days. The second sponsor is Brilliant. Brilliant illuminates the soul of math, science, and engineering through bite-sized interactive learning experiences. Brilliant's courses explore the laws that shape our world, elevating math and science from something to be feared to a delightful experience of guided discovery. More on them later. If you'd like to hear more conversations like this, please do consider going to patreon.com slash and contributing whatever you can. You can also submit guest requests there and even questions. There's also a crypto address if you're more comfortable there and PayPal as well. The plan is to have more conversations like this, but with the same quality, the same level of depth. Soon, we'll be hosting Donald Hoffman and Yosha Bach. That's one to look forward to. Next week, I'm speaking to Luis Alessandro, as well as Jeremy Corbell, not together, separately. Those will be an AMA, so feel free to submit your questions to them in the link that I'm going to provide in the description. And in about a week and a half, I'm speaking to Chris Langan, who has the highest IQ recorded in America. He has a cognitive theoretic model of the universe, which is a vast theory of everything, and I'm I've just been dipping my toes into that toe, and it's extremely, well, it's, it's unlike the other theories of everything you've heard. Thank you so much, and enjoy. Anka, I'm, you know, I'm aware of your, your podcast. I've um, dipped into some of your conversations. 
Um, so I, I'm aware of your, your your podcast, its subject matter, and and, and of your style, which which I always find um, I, I've always felt you're a very very good interviewer, pro probing and questioning, but not not out to prove somebody wrong or to to make a your own point or to be adversarial. So so yes, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Great, thank you. Which podcast? Or podcasts? Did you watch? Is there one that you particularly? I've watched. Liked? Well, I've I've just dipped into several, but the ones I've watched um, at length were um, well, Bernardo Castrup, who's a friend of mine. So um, uh, and uh, Donald Hoffman, who I I don't know so well. I have met him once, and I'm familiar with his work. Not nearly as familiar. I'm very familiar with Bernardo. We see each other, and and. Uh, but so th those are the ones that I've I've dipped into a little bit more extensively than the others. But particularly when when you invited me onto your, onto your podcast, I wanted to just to get, get a little sort of sense of what you do, what you're where you're coming from. Uh, um, so I, I explored a little bit. Great. Okay. I should say perhaps, uh, um, Kurt. I'm, I'm sure you already know this. I, I'm not a mathematician or a physicist. That's fine. Do you mind giving a brief overview as to your philosophy, as well as how you arrived at non-dualism and what non-dualism is? Okay, so a, a, a very brief overview of my philosophy would be, would be this, that there is a single reality whose nature is consciousness or awareness, or, or in traditional religious language, spirit. And it is from this uh, single, uh, infinite and indivisible whole or reality that everyone and everything derives its apparently independent existence. And uh, th that, in a nutshell, is, is the non-dual perspective. How, how did I arrive at this? I, as a young child, my mother tells me as a as a seven-year-old boy i said to her once that i considered that everything was god's dream so that was a very early intuition god was a my my simple traditional religious way of uh, describing reality as the dream or the activity of um of of of, of a single um, infinite uh, aware being. So this was my, my early childhood intuition. I then, of course, uh, forgot uh, this intuition as I grew up, grew up. And it was reawakened again in my mid to late teens, when I started exploring these matters again, and I came across the classical uh, Advaita Vedanta tradition in India, which is the, the classical non-dual one of the classical non-dual traditions in India, and I started studying this philosophy and practicing uh, meditation in this tradition really for the next uh, 20 years or so. And uh, after this period, I later met uh, the man Francis Lucille, who, with whom I spent the next 12 or 13 years um, deepening my exploration um, of, of, of my own true nature. And uh, during this long period, it took 30, 35 years, the, the, the nature of reality just became clearer and clearer to me. So this, this early childish intuition, uh, I had to forget it, and then I then had to find the way back to it through my own explorations. Um, and contemplation of the nature of my self. What's the difference between experience, awareness, and consciousness? Oh, I would say that experience was the activity of awareness or consciousness. First of all, I use the words consciousness and awareness synonymously. Not everybody does, but, but I do. Uh, experience would be the activity or the movement of consciousness. So the relationship between awareness, the relationship between experience and awareness would be the same relationship as the relationship between 
the waves and currents in an ocean and the ocean itself. Or to use an, another analogy, the same relationship between the contents of a movie and the screen. So just as the, the ocean, or more accurately, the water is the, is the reality of the, the waves and the currents, the waves and the currents are as such a, the movement of water, the activity of water, uh, just as a movie could be said to be the activity of the screen within the limits of the metaphor. So experience, and by experience in this context I mean objective experience, would be the activity or the movement of consciousness. Can you explain what you mean when you say, in ignorance I am something, in understanding I am nothing, in love I am everything? In, in ignorance I am nothing. That is, ignorance in this context does not mean stupidity as it does in common parlance. It's a term that I borrow from the uh, Vedantic tradition. It means in the state in which we ignore the uh, ultimate reality, in the state in which we ignore the ultimate reality of ourself as infinite consciousness, that is when we believe and feel ourself to be a temporary finite person or self, an ego. In that state, I consider myself to be, to be something, a part, a body in which a mind exists. I have a quick question about that. Are we consciously being ignorant of it? To me, ignorance implies that you know that there's something behind that door, but you don't open it. Whereas being unaware is that you have no idea you even passed a door. In this sense, ignorance would, would be a partial, incomplete knowledge of oneself. So we all have a, a knowledge of ourself or a sense of being myself. But most people's sense of being myself is mixed with the content of their experience. So whilst everybody has a sense of their self, most people's sense of their self is uh, limited or mixed with or identified with the content of experience. And this gives us a partial or inaccurate view of ourself. This is what is meant by, by ignorance. So in, 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 un, under the influence of ignorance, in other words, when we ignore the reality of ourself, which I would suggest is infinite consciousness, we seem to be something temporary and finite, namely an individual body-mind. So it, it, this is what I mean. In, in ignorance, we seem to be something. Something in this context is, is a, a fragment, a person. I understand. Uh, uh, the next is, in understanding, I am nothing. In understanding, I am nothing. If we then begin to explore what we essentially are. And in order to find what we essentially are, we remove everything from us that is not essential. The, the, the essence of anything is, that, is the aspect of that thing that cannot be removed from it. So if we remove from ourself everything that is not essential to us, namely our thoughts, mm -hmm. our images, our memories, our activities, our relationships, our feelings, uh, what, what we what we end up with is not itself a thing. It is none of the things that we normally believe and feel ourselves to be. It is not a thought. It is not a feeling. It's not a sensation. It's not a perception. It's not an activity. It's not a relationship. So from this point of view, what we, we could say that what I essentially am is not nothing objective. In that sense, in understanding, I am nothing. I am not a thing. Yes, yes, no thing, literally. But we are awareness, or we are a perspective, or... We are, we are only no thing from the point of view of the previous statement in which we believed we were something. So in reference to the previous belief, I am something, when we make this deep investigation into our essential nature, we realize, no, I am not something. I am not a thing. Okay. So to make an analogy, it's like someone who has clothes that say, these clothes are a part of me. That's the first step. That's an ignorance. I am something. 
then the second person starts to take away and say, well, I'm still me, even without my jacket. I'm still me without my socks. And they realize they're naked. Now, I know you're taking nakedness slightly further, but for this analogy, then that person says, okay, in understanding, I realize I am naked or I am nothing. And then we're about to get to the that side. So now, if you were to continue this analogy, you not only take off all your clothes, but you were to continue the exploration and, and to take off, so to speak, everything that like your clothes is not fundamental to you. Take off your thoughts, take off your feelings, take off your perceptions, take off your sensations. What you're left with is pure non-objective consciousness, pure aware being, which is itself not a thing. It is not a thought or a feeling or a sensation or a perception. So I, I state it in the negative. It is not a thing, only in reference to the previous thing that I believed myself to be. I, I and understand. then having having recognized what I essentially am is this non-objective consciousness. If I then explore the relationship between what I am with what everything else is, I discover that what I essentially am is the same as what everything else essentially is. In other words, consciousness is not just the essential reality of myself as a person. It is the essential reality of the universe. And this recognition that what we essentially are and what the universe essentially is, is the same infinite and indivisible whole, is what we call love. In other words, love is the, the recognition that there are not two things, that there isn't really a separate subject and an object, that, that, that we share our being. That's the experience of love or beauty. So that's, that's why the third, in the, the, the third phrase, uh, um, in love I am everything. So that then we realize that what I essentially am is the reality of everything. In other words, I am what, not I as a person, it is not I as a person am identified with the universe. It is my essential nature as consciousness is the reality of the universe. So this identity between the individual self and the universal being it, it is the experience of love. Okay, let's say you're speaking to Richard Dawkins, the stereotypical materialist, hard-headed scientist, which comprise some part of our audience, but mainly we have people who are extremely open, and I'm grateful for that. But there are some people who say, anytime someone talks about consciousness as fundamental, they don't know what they're talking about. You have to define consciousness. That's not the definition. Oh, you've made the definition of consciousness so wide, it applies to everything. So yes, okay, in some way, consciousness is fundamental. What experience or experiment or exercise can you take them and even me through right now that perhaps takes a minute that can help open that door even if it's just a crack well let, let's let's start with the 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 exploration of the essential nature of ourself so if you were now to to go through the the experiment that we that we described previously, remove from yourself in your imagination, do this thought experiment, remove from yourself your thoughts, because your thoughts are obviously not essential to you, they are continually appearing and disappearing, a bit, but you remain intact. You don't feel that a little bit of yourself disappears every time a cell... Should I be sitting? Should I be sitting, Should I be sitting for this? Should I be sitting, sitting down, or it doesn't matter? Yeah, no, no, just, just stay exactly as you are. All right, okay. Sorry for interrupting. No, no, that's all right. So, so re remove, remove your thoughts, or, or it's not actually necessary to get rid of your thoughts. You can imagine removing your thoughts. They are not essential to you. Imagine removing your feelings. They are obviously not essential to you. Imagine removing your memories. Imagine removing your bodily sensations, the tingling of your face or your hands or your feet. Imagine you're in a sensory deprivation tank. You have no, no sights, no sounds, no tastes, no textures, no smells. None of these are essential to you. So you are, to continue the undressing metaphor, you're taking off everything that is superfluous to you. Now what remains?
of I would call it something that feels or senses. Something that feels, uh, th something that could, could we broaden it and say something that experiences, or or even even um, more accurate, something that that knows. And by knows, I don't mean conceptually. Something that something that it, that just that that, kn that that knows or is aware or experiences. Right, you're right. Now I'm I'm not saying that I was able to get there in its pure form, but I could see myself you, in there. No, no, no. You, you you're dead right. Your you, your answer was 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 um, was perfect. That that which remains is something that senses, but but something that is aware, but without right. anything to be aware of. Something that experiences without there being anything to experience. We could mm -hmm. call it pure experiencing without any objective content or pure knowing or pure consciousness. Now, can you go okay. further back? Let's continue the, the undressing. In your actual experience, can you remove consciousness? Can you go further back in your experience than that which knows or is aware. Right, right, right. So what you're getting at right now is an identification between you, so me, and awareness. Because as soon as I say where I'm not aware, then I'm no longer there. As soon as you, as soon as you say I am not aware, I'm then going to ask you, what is the I who is not aware? What, what experience could you have of that one in the absence of awareness? I don't know. You couldn't have any experience of it because awareness is the prerequisite for experience. So to postulate something prior to awareness is, is purely conceptual. It is, it is abstract. It cannot be verified in experience because awareness is the prerequisite for experience. So if we're wanting not to talk about abstract philosophy, but if we're wanting to make an experiential exploration of ourself, we have to admit that we can go all the way back to awareness. We can remove everything from ourselves apart from the fact of being aware. And in that sense, if we stay close to the evidence of experience, awareness or consciousness is our essential irreducible self, if we can call it a self. Now, can I ask you, a, can we continue the experiment? Please. If I were to ask you now, uh, describe the sensations of the soles of your feet, J just Pluck a couple of words. Just give us a, a tingling, tingling, perfect, and slight pain, tingling, painful. Uh, okay, a slight. Now, if I were to more warmth, uh, but also okay. I feel like my toes are cold. Perfect. If I were to ask you to describe your thoughts now, just very briefly, fleeting. Okay, that that's that's sufficient. That fleeting and rapid. Fleeting and rapid. Perfect. Okay. Now, do the experiment we previously did. Remove everything from yourself that is not essential to yourself, and you remain just with the fact of being aware, without being aware of anything. And tell us about that experience. Rupert, I'm trying to get there. No, no. I imagine that I'm not an experienced meditator. And no, no, no. On, on the contrary, can, it's. I can see I'm getting to. Kurt, it's much better. Sorry to interrupt. It's much better if you're not an experienced meditator and you don't have okay. the correct answers. You, you're, 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 you, okay, great, great, great. Maybe I can so serve you, as a you, vessel for some of the people who are similar. So, so to, 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 to try again to, to describe, try to find words that best describe the pure fact of that which is aware. You, in other words, what you okay. refer to as your okay. essential irreducible self. Can you tell okay. us about it? Yeah, and I, I can also find 
imagery, almost like artistic representations. I'll explain that after. But I want you to describe the actual experience. Like you told us, your, your toes are tingling, they're cold. Your thoughts are fleeting and rapid. Try to give us a, words that accurately describe the nature of that which is aware without referring to anything that you are aware of. It feels expansive. It feels... Okay, let me, let me just, let's just stay with that for a minute. It, 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 expansive so it, that 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 is it, it's vast it's not tiny it's not small it's not contracted no, but it's not infinite it's larger okay. than i am oh. until i start to hear little okay. bits of noises and then it brings Tr me try back. to tell us about the edge of it the boundary you say it's expansive but it's not infinite so if, if you can if you can say from your experience that it's not infinite you must you must perceive a boundary to it now Remember that you're referring to the fact of being aware without referring to anything that you are aware of. So tell us, what is your experience of a boundary to awareness? It's difficult to describe because as I try to get to the edges, it's shaky, unsteady, and unresolved. The way that I can I can make an analogy, it's like if I'm in a forest, I'll just denude the forest of the trees, but you need the trees for this example, and I have a flashlight and I'm trying to find the edge, but it's the edge is beyond the darkness, beyond the purview of the flashlight. So I'm looking for the edge, but I can't see it, but I know that there's an edge to it, or at least I get a feeling that there's an edge to it. You have a feeling that there's an edge to it. You say, I know there is an edge to it, but you can't actually find the edge. So you don't know there is an edge to it. You believe that there is an edge to it. And your feelings arise in, a, in, in such a way that they support your belief. So your feeling that there is an edge comes from not from your knowledge that there is an edge, but your belief that there is an edge. Now, here, okay, so we're not interested yeah. either in feelings or in beliefs. We're interested in truth. And we, we consider experience to be the test of truth. We're, we're, we're subject okay. So go back to your experience of yourself, the experience of being aware or awareness itself, and realize that your, your knowledge that it has a boundary is not in fact knowledge, it's belief. It's substantiated by your feelings, but your feelings are substantiating a belief, not knowledge. So here we're only interested in knowledge. What knowledge do you have that there is a boundary to awareness without reference to anything that you are aware of? So there's a distinction here between feelings and knowledge. Do you mind explicating that for me? Because to me, if I'm just this awareness, I don't know how to dissociate between the two in this form. Feelings are something that you are aware of. So the question now is not whether feelings have a border or limit or an edge. The question is that which is aware of your feelings. I, I agree with you, the feelings are limited. For instance, they come and go, they are limited in time. But the question is, what about that which is aware of your feelings? Does that share their limits? Just give me 10 more seconds. It's hard to say, Rupert. I'm trying. I imagine trying is the opposite of what I should be doing. It's good. Tr is tr tr trying is, no, 
No, but trying is exactly what you should be doing. When you say trying, what you're really doing is you're exploring your experience. You're not just conceptualizing about it. When you're not thinking about it. You're, you're in the lab. You're not in the classroom. We're in the right. in the classroom. We get the theory. Consciousness is infinite. But no, that that's the that, that gives us. Uh, 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 we're open to the possibility, but we want to test that possibility. We want to come out of the classroom. We want to go into the lab and test whether it's true. So now, yes. what, what you call trying is is testing the validity of the theory that consciousness may be unlimited. Well, the way to test that is to see in our actual experience. We're not speculating about consciousness. Being conscious or being aware is our experience. We don't need to speculate about it. We can test it because it is our experience. So we are now testing whether or not we have the actual experience of a limit to consciousness. Now, mm. let me just go a little bit further. But I'd like to come back to this experiment because it's really, it's really key. It, what is it in us that could explore the nature of awareness? Whatever these are questions you would like me to ponder, or the audience, or well, me to actually yes, I'd like respond. I'd like to 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 explore with you, uh, and of course for for your audience, they they can do the experiment with us. I'd like to exp to, to to just ascertain what it is in us that is able to explore the nature of awareness. Now, let, let me elaborate. Whatever it is that is able to explore the nature of awareness must know awareness. Yes? It must be aware of awareness. We couldn't explore something we are not aware of. Okay. okay. Now the question is, what is it that is aware of the fact that we are aware? Is awareness known by another kind of awareness? Or is it you, awareness, that knows that you are aware? I would say that for me, it's tricky when, when I say me, when I say I even, but when I say me, I would say that I'm aware of my my awareness. Exactly. Perfect. There, there are not two awarenesses in you, one that is the subject of your exploration and one that is the object. Well, for me, I didn't I don't know if I did it properly, but I was aware of an awareness. And in that awareness, it was as if that outside awareness was the object and I was the subject looking at my own awareness. If that was the case, the object awareness that you were looking at would have been some kind of objective experience and would, as such, have had a limit to it. But that's not the case. When we say, I am aware that I am aware, there isn't one eye that is aware and another eye that is aware that we are aware. It is I, awareness, that is aware that I am aware. In other words, awareness is self-aware. Okay. So now, when I ask you, do you have a limit, do you have any experience of a limit to your awareness? What I'm really doing is asking you awareness. Do you have any actual experience of a limit in yourself, to yourself? I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. If I'm understanding the question correctly, it's that I have some awareness. I'm from a perspective right now. I have experiences, but I'm trying to just look at Forget the experiences that are thoughts and sensations, but look at what's experiencing those thoughts and sensations. 
Okay, so that is something like a perspective, which we're also calling awareness. Now, can I be aware of my own perspective? Can I be aware of awareness? Well, you, if I were to ask you now, Kurt, are you aware? Not what are you aware of? Just a simple question. Are you aware? What would you say? I'd say I, I am partially aware and that I hope I'm aware because I want to be present for you. Yes, but it is your experience. I'm now. not trying to be. No, no, yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to be. But it, 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 surely it is obvious to you now that you are aware. Yes. I, like, here's where I, the reason why I'm hesitating is it's fairly simple. It's that when I'm driving, let's say, let's say I'm driving down the highway, there are obviously most of that, obviously, most of that constitutes gaps in memory because we're moving along unconsciously. But then if I was to be tapped on the shoulder at any point, and I look back at the previous five seconds, I can recall them, but not just recall them, but at least have a feeling that I was conscious during them. Although if you were to tap me two minutes later instead of five seconds, I wouldn't be able to recall that little five second gap. And I would have said that was a lapse in my consciousness. So the what constitutes no, it, it, it was a lapse consciously in the, it was a, sorry to interrupt it was a lapse in the content of your consciousness you didn't have any experience of a lapse in being aware you were aware all the way through the experience but there was a gap in what you were aware of it, it, okay it, it, it's like it, it, when one movie ends and another movie begins there is a gap the gap is not the absence of the screen, it is the absence of the content. You would never say mm -hmm. when a movie uh -huh, uh -huh. comes to an end, you don't say the screen has come to an end. So what you're getting me to do is to identify with the screen or try to get close to the screen rather well, than what's well, being projected You've already it. said, Kurt, as a result of our initial experiment, when I remove everything from myself that is not essential, all that remains is that which experiences or that which is aware. And now I'm trying to push you a little bit further to discover the nature of that which is aware. Let me, let me, and, and, and by the way, you're, you're doing very well. I know it doesn't feel like it, but you're, the reason doesn't. you're having so much difficulty, uh, uh, well, well uh, 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 let me say about that later, but, but sure, it, sure. It, it, it may not feel like it to you, but it's a very good sign that you're struggling with this so much. When I asked you, what is the, tell us about the sensations of the soles of your feet. We didn't discuss it for 15 minutes. You just told me they're cold and tingling. When I asked you about the nature of your thoughts, we didn't debate it for 15 minutes. You just told me they're fleeting and rapid. Now, when I ask you, what is the nature of that which is aware? We're still talking about it 20 minutes later. And it's good that we are because it's not clear to you that the nature of your sensations in your thoughts is absolutely clear to you. The nature of your awareness is not clear to you. That's very good. So that, 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 that's the, actually that, that's the beginning, that, that's the best sign at the beginning of this investigation. I, I want to just add another analogy here to, to help you, to possibly help you. Did, did you, well, I certainly did as a young, child, I lay awake in bed, wondering how far space went on. As, as someone interested in physics and mathematics, I'm quite sure early on in your life, you must have imagined how far space goes on and you go on and then you eventually, you come to what you think is a limit of, your, of space and then you think, but hang on, what, what's outside that? That must be space mm -hmm. also. So, and, and you, you experience this frustration that you cannot imagine something outside space you, know, you, you familiar you had that feeling thought as a boy yeah now imagine that instead of you exploring the nature of space as something objective imagine now that space physical space itself were conscious just for the sake of this thought experiment imagine okay. the okay. faculty of being aware to physical space and now imagine that physical space itself were to explore itself would, would it ever find a limit in itself 
I'm just talking about an, a, the ordinary classical conventional idea no. of space. No, as far as I can tell. Yeah, exactly. And I keep prefacing this with as far as I can tell yeah, because it, often, sorry, just to be clear, often with when we're playing, when we're using language, often there are linguistic tricks that that prevent us from seeing truths. So, for example. I can't give an example, but I'm sure you can think of examples. Some examples from math would be the barber's paradox. Who cuts the barber's hair if the barber cuts all those who don't cut their own hair, but everyone's shaved in the town. And then that leads to an investigation in set theory to overcome that. And so there's many, there are many times when an answer seemed obviously it's so-and-so, or obviously it's not so-and-so, that years, decades, even hundreds of years later, we found out, well, it's not so obvious the more we investigate it, there are subtleties. So that's why I'm prefacing with, it seems like what you're saying is correct. And my feeling is like, my feeling is in accordance with what you're saying, but I don't have a, I don't have the certainty that you do. Perhaps that's okay. because I lack okay. the well, can, years. Can, can we leave it like this? I don't mean leave it sure. like this. Can we agree, at least thus far, that when you explore the experience of being aware, you don't find any limit there. You don't find an edge to the, the space of awareness, if we can add a space-like quality to it, just for the purposes of this conversation. Yes, yes. And what I would say is that if I try to be aware of not being aware, Sorry, if I try to get into a place of non-awareness, which is the border of awareness, if such a border existed, I can't because in order to know it, I would have to be aware of exactly. it. Exactly. And thus, by definition, I'm locked within this realm of awareness. There may exist what's outside awareness. I just don't know it. At least I can't know it as far as I can tell. You can't know it. Could Can anybody know it? If by body you mean another awareness, then I would say no. Could, could any kind of a being, embodied or whatever other kinds of beings there may be in reality, could any being know that which exists prior to or in the absence of awareness? I would say that an aware being, if one is to be a being and synonymize that with being aware, then it would be no, as far as I can tell. But like I said, there are subtleties that decades later we find out, oh, okay, if we did, if we considered so-and-so at the edge well, case. Hold on. So as far as I can tell. C c hold on. You say as far as you can tell and maybe decades later, but 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 imagine decades later. What, what kind of, in the absence of awareness, would it be possible to be aware of anything? Can anybody... I would say no by definition, it, but... No by again, definition, I'm, yes. Right, right. Ca in other again, words... I'm couching this, and I'm not trying to be difficult. Rupert, no, no, be please, difficult. Be, you... be difficult, Kurt. Okay. It, it's good that you're okay. being difficult. The reason is that let's imagine it's true that there's dead matter, and that's materialism, but let's also imagine that there exists consciousness, so let's imagine a dual existence. Then one may say, well, what's not matter and not consciousness at the same time? Well, there's nothing. Well, I don't know. Maybe there's a third element that has nothing to do with matter or consciousness that can interact with them in some way. That's why I'm saying. Yes. Uh, from definition, from the definition. Yes. Yes. But you're starting with the presumption that there may be something outside consciousness which exists alongside consciousness. Now, if we try to find that stuff that exists outside consciousness. In fact, we, we have been trying to find it for a couple of millennia now. Uh, we don't find that stuff. It's, it's, we have to, it, it's an abstract category of experience which nobody has ever or could ever come in contact with. For those listening, I'll just recapitulate what you said shortly so that the people who maybe tuned in later can understand when you're saying that we can never know what's outside of, we can never know the dead matter. What you're referring to is that in order, even in the lab, if let's say we're analyzing an electron and someone points to, well, that's not conscious, but you only know of the electron through your own consciousness. 
Is it something like that? Is that what you're saying? That we can never get to this dead matter, unconscious. But, but your, your, your question material. implies that there is something called dead matter, albeit that we cannot know. What I'm implying by this line of questioning is why presume that there is something called dead matter in the first place, whether we can know it or not, because it is not consistent with experience. And if we want to build a model of reality, why start with an abstract category of experience, namely dead matter, that nobody has ever or could ever experience, and then try to build a model of the one thing we do experience, namely conscious experience, th that is apparently derived from the one thing we never experience, which is dead matter. That That is convoluted. Personally, I'm not saying I presume. No, 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 I, I realize. I, I, camp or the other. I, I realize, I understand. You're, you're playing okay. devil's I, advocate. And, yeah, and, 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 let me, and let me give an answer to that. So why presume what we can't know? So that's an epistemological claim. But then you're taking this claim about epistemology that we only have access to a certain set of data points, and those data points are all conscious points. So why would we ever posit a non-conscious data point given all we've only seen is consciousness and all we can see is consciousness or all we can experience is consciousness okay so i'll give you a reason why to posit this is not necessarily the reason why it is positive but i'm just telling you here's one we can imagine universes that don't interact with ours such as in the potential m theory there are brains well, in some flavors of string theory, there's things called D brains, and then they interact, and perhaps when they collide, they create big bangs. And there are other cyclical models of the universe that we can't, that say that universes existed before us and may after us, that we can't actually touch or see. But the reason to play with them, and this is not a reason to assume that they're true, but I'm giving an argument to play with them. The reason to play with them is because what we find is through often convoluted arguments, what we'll see is actually what we thought of as an uninteracting piece is an intimation of that other universe. So for example, even though we can't see the quantum foam, some people talk about the quantum foam at the bottom of, at the Planck scale, even though we can't see that. So why do we think it exists? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One may be that in the early universe when the Big Bang happened and there was a huge inflation, maybe an imprint of that moment's quantum foam is on the sky. So at this place where we thought we could never get to, even by principle we could never get to, we can theorize what would it be like if that were here? And then thousands of heads of brilliant people coming, using this and playing with it, come to conclusions that say, actually, if we look in this direction, we can see an imprint of so-and-so. Okay, so that's why I'm saying, I'm not saying I believe that there exists matter outside consciousness or consciousness outside matter. I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm just saying that there is a reason to toy with it. Yes. Kurt, I'm not, I just want to be clear, I'm not suggesting or I hope implying that all there is to reality is the contents, the sum total of each of our finite minds. I would suggest that our finite minds were a very small segment, a, a narrow cross-section, a localization of the, the infinite mind or the one reality, the one consciousness. Rupert, can I ask you a question about that? I have a source here. Uh, unfortunately, it's just a link and I can't click a link with a pen. Maybe this will jog your memory. When you were speaking of the infinite nature of consciousness and its oneness, you were saying that it can't be cleaved. There can't be two fundamental consciousnesses because the divide between them would have to be finite. I don't know if this rings a bell, but I was wondering why is that the case? And I'll give you a mathematical example that you have the flat plane like this screen right here, but imagine it extended to infinity. You can cleave the, what's called the R2 plane because these are, this is real, this is real. You can cleave the R2 plane with an infinite line. So now you've separated it. So I don't see why a separation necessarily implies a finiteness to create the border. If consciousness was separate, if it had a if it had a um, a limit to it, 
in, in, in some dimension, if it, if it had a limit, it would be, it would be finite. And if you see me close my eyes, please, I'm trying to experience what you're saying and not just intellectually deal with it. With the, the experiment that we did, you didn't quite go so far as say, yes, in my own experience of myself, there is no limit to my awareness. But you, you certainly found it very difficult to find any limit. So you went so far as to say, I cannot find a limit to awareness. And if anyone, uh, anyone who's listening, or indeed anybody, did the same experiment that we did, and understood it, and participated, they would come to the same conclusion. Now, if, we, if nobody has ever, or could ever find a limit to their awareness, why don't we s start our model of reality in a way that is consistent with our experience, namely unlimited awareness. Th that is our experience, that is our primary, fundamental, irreducible experience. Now, if we want to build a model of reality, why don't we start with that which is primary and fundamental in our experience? It, it, it's the one given, it's the ontological primitive in our experience. Why don't and, and and I would suggest that we as finite minds or apparently individual selves are, are localizations of or apparent localizations of this unlimited awareness. I, by the way, I agree with you that if one is to take parsimony seriously, one shouldn't posit what exists outside consciousness because all that's within consciousness can explain in the same way. This is Bernardo Castrop's argument, at least as far as I've heard it. Yes, so l l let's explore that further. I if we posit the possibility that, uh, if, if we stay, stay close to the evidence of experience, all we can be absolutely certain of is that there is consciousness and its contents or its activity, which we call experience. And it is our experience that consciousness is unlimited. Put these two facts of experience together. Could, can we build a model of reality that is based only on consciousness and its own activity? Now, take what happens in a dream. If, if our own individual mind, the finite mind, is a, a localization of infinite consciousness, then we would expect our finite mind to have at least some of the behavioural properties of infinite consciousness. In other words, that it would behave in a similar way. When we fall asleep at night, our own mind, which is um, uh, an indivisible field, albeit a, a limited field of consciousness, our own mind imagines the dreamed world within itself. But our own mind, the dreaming mind, doesn't perceive the dreamed world directly. In order to perceive the dreamed world, it has to simultaneously localize itself within its own dream as an apparently separate subject of experience, from whose perspective it views its own activity as the dreamed world. Although it doesn't know that it's a dreamed world, because it is localized as one of the objects in that world. It is immersed in the dreamed world. So from the point of view of the dreamed character, the dreamed world seems to exist outside of itself and to be made out of something other than itself, namely matter. Mm -hmm. But when we mm -hmm. wake up in the morning, we realize, no, the dreamed world wasn't divided into a multiplicity and diversity of objects made out of matter, made out of, uh, known by a subject made out of mind. The entire dreamed world, including the separate subject of experience that I seemed to become, was all the activity of my own indivisible mind. The dreamed world was just what my, the activity of my own mind looked like from a localized perspective. Now, instead of going down from the waking state to the dream state, go up from the waking state to consciousness. 
and consider that what we experience as the waking state is a kind of dream in the universal mind of consciousness and that each of us as individual people are localized perspectives of infinite consciousness within infinite consciousness from whose perspective it perceives its own activity as the universe. And this would account for, going back to that uh, early definition that you asked me about, this would account for the identity between ourself and the universe, the shared identity or the shared reality of the subject and object. Okay, what occurs to me when you say that is that it seems like, please correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like one is conflating conscious activity within the brain and unconscious activity. So for example, let's say there's a Rupert and there's a Kurt. Okay, so Kurt's going to sleep. Kurt then, you're saying Kurt generates the world of Mexico in the dream. And then Kurt also generates a Kurt avatar, which has a perspective in order to experience Mexico. But I would say that there's this creative matrix or a mythopoetic element that's unconscious that generated Mexico. And then this Kurt, conscious Kurt, went to Avatar Kurt in Mexico. Not conscious Kurt created both Mexico and Avatar Kurt, but conscious Kurt became a perspective in Avatar Kurt. And so that's what, firstly, I'll say that. And I want to hear what you have to say about that. So, so the Avatar, what I refer to as the dreamed character, is a, a localization of what you call conscious Kurt, what I call the dreamer's mind. So your, your own mind has overlooked the fact that it is in fact creating the dreamed world, Mexico in this great case, that your own mind has localized itself within its own creation, has forgotten that it is creating it, and then actually imagines that the world that it is perceiving, Mexico, gave rise to that which is perceiving it. That which is perceiving okay. it does okay. not exist anywhere in the dreamed world or in the time and space that seem to be real from the perspective of the avatar or dreamed character. I see. I see. So what I'm hearing is there's the use of the word mind and consciousness, which I'd like to delineate. And of course, you're welcome to say that they're both the same. But for this case, let me say. So there's the mind, which comprises the brain activity, let's say, in the materialist sense. I would say that then we don't know how consciousness works, but let's imagine the materialists are correct in some way that it's a circuit that gets run and then you are conscious of some sensory information that gets fed to it. Let's just imagine it's like that, like a machine. Okay. I would say that this machine, the mind, some of the brain activity went toward creating Mexico and some of the brain activity went toward creating the, the dream character in your words. And then Kurt consciousness here Kurt consciousness didn't create Mexico. I wish I could. That would be f extremely fantastic if I could do so on a whim. It wasn't my conscious mind. It was my brain activity, which comprises my unconscious mind that did so. And so if one is to take this analogy seriously and say, well, this is what's happening at the earth, sorry, at the universe at large, the universe is conscious splitting itself up. But in this dream analogy, there's a, already a difference between conscious and unconscious mind. Okay. I, I see what you're getting at. I, I agree that what appears in Kurt's dream as Mexico is a manifestation of that region of his mind that he is not conscious of in the waking state. Let me let me g g give you a, a, another a, analogy. Um, at the risk of mixing our, our analogies too much. Let, let's say that, um, Kurt, in the waking state, you, d due to um, your early childhood experiences, I'm just imagining, let, 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 uh, I'm not insinuating anything, just imagine that as a result of early childhood experiences you, where you were very traumatized, you grew up with a feeling of fear. 
And this feeling of fear was, was unbearable to you. And as you grew up, you found all kinds of strategies whereby you didn't have to fully feel it or face it. You, you managed to distract yourself from it. You didn't deal with the fear, but you, you found strategies of activities, relationships, substances, and so on that, that have, have, have avoided having to deal with it. So that the, the fear, as it were, was buried in you, in the deeper recesses of your mind, that uh, some 10, 20 years later were no longer available to you in the waking state. You, you were no longer even aware that you had this uh, um, subliminal trauma stored in, in the deeper layers of your mind. Now, you fall asleep and you dream that you're being chased by a tiger. So what lay in the deeper regions, the so-called unconscious, which is not really outside conscious, it is just outside the narrow compass of the waking state mind. The, the fear that lay in the deeper regions of your mind, in the waking state, the subliminal mm. mental or emotional activity that lay in the deepest regions of your mind in the waking state, manifest as your environment when you go one step down to the dream state. And that, so that subliminal fear in the waking state appears as a tiger in your dream from the localized perspective of the avatar, the dreamed character. Now, could it be that what we, and this is what I'm suggesting, that, that what we experience as the waking state world is a manifestation of the activity of infinite consciousness, the mental activity, in religious language, we could call it the thoughts of God. And by that, I don't mean literally thoughts. I mean the mental activity, the activity I'm using the word God as infinite consciousness, the activity of infinite consciousness that is not uh, accessible to us, uh, that, that, that is not experienced directly by infinite consciousness. Infinite consciousness can only perceive its own activity when it views it through the localized perspective of each of our minds. So there's so much you said. I'm going to get right back to that one. I want to make sure that I say it about the infinite and not being able to experience itself unless it becomes finite. I'm going to table that. I'm saying it out loud so I remember. Yes, it, yes. The infinite doesn't experience its own activity directly. It has to do so through the agency of a finite mind, just as the dreamer doesn't experience the dreamed world directly. It can only do so through the avatar or dreamed character. I hope you're going to ask me, why can't the infinite directly perceive its own mental activity? Why can't the infinite perceive its own... Now, its mental activity is by definition finite. It's something that moves, changes, comes and goes. Now, I would suggest that the infinite cannot know the finite directly. Because if the infinite were to know the finite directly, it would have to know a finite object from every possible point of view simultaneously. And it would not experience that as a single object. It would actually be utter darkness. For the same reason that when you look at the mic in front of you, you only perceive it as a mic because you're viewing it from one location. Imagine if you were to view your mic from two locations in your room and you were to superimpose those two images on top of each other. You'd begin to get a blurred image of the mic. Now imagine that you were to view the mic in your room for, let's say, 10 different locations in the room. The mic would begin to look like a like a cubist painting. It, its integrity would begin to fall apart. Now, imagine that you were to view the mic from every possible location in space, including all the locations within the mic itself. You were to superimpose all these images on top of each other. You would not see a mic. In order to see a mic, you have to see it from a localized perspective, from a single point of view that enables you to see a single object. And it's for that reason that, that the, the, I would suggest the infinite cannot see its own activity directly. It, if, if, if it wants to see its own activity in form, if it wants to realize its own activity, it must overlook the fact that it is infinite consciousness, just as the dreamer's mind overlooks the fact that it is the dreamer's mind. It must localize itself in its own creation, from whose 
localized perspective, it is then able to perceive its own activity as the universe. That's what I would suggest we are seeing. When we look at the universe, I would suggest that we are a segment of infinite consciousness from whose perspective it is looking at the unlocalized, the rest of its own unlocalized activity. Okay, so I have a couple questions regarding this. Okay, I have three, and I want to make sure that I can hold on to all of them. Number one, is the initial claim that we have this infinite field, like an ocean, let's imagine consciousness is like an ocean, that for consciousness, for this ocean to experience itself, it needs to take a segment of itself. And then necessarily this segment comes from a finite place and thus can't know the whole. Okay, put, just pause there. Consciousness doesn't need to localize itself within itself as a separate subject for experience in order to know itself as it essentially is, it only needs to do so if it wants to know its activity in form. Let, 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 me, let me relate this to the activity of the dreamer's, dreamer and the, the dreamer's mind and the dream character. The, the, the dreamer's mind, the dreamer, doesn't need to have a dream and localize itself within its own dream if it wants to know itself. It can know itself perfectly well in the waking state and within the limits of the metaphor. It does know itself. No, it doesn't fall asleep and have a dream in order to know itself. It has a dream, falls asleep and has a dream in order to know that aspect of its own activity that it doesn't know in the waking state. You fall asleep in order for your fear to become manifest to you as the tiger. So in your dream, you, you become aware of your own activity, but you're, you don't have a dream in order to know the nature of yourself. So this is very important. Awareness doesn't localize itself in the form of each of us in order to know itself. It knows itself by itself. In other words, awareness is self-aware. But in order to know the contents of its own activity, it must do so from the localized perspective of a finite mind. Okay, must. See, this is the different this is where I'm having a bit of trouble because I can understand can. It can do so from the perspective of a limited creature. But the must I don't see. And I'll give you an example. But, but the, the, I, that was the example I gave you about looking at the mic from an infant number of viewpoints. Yeah, uh, if you saw a microphone from two different perspectives you can somewhat understand you may have to switch between the front and the back you can somewhat understand it and then if you put three and then it's getting tough and then obviously if you put 10 it's almost impossible let alone a multitude like infinity however some people say that infinite consciousness is infinitely intelligent at the same time and i would say that the fact that i can't when i look at a microphone on an image and superimpose another microphone from another perspective that the fact that that I can perceive that somewhat, but then can't perceive it if there's three or four different perspectives is a function of my lack of intelligence. But if I was infinite in intelligence, I don't see a reason why showing up. Okay, but you in your hidden in your question, Kurt, is the presumption that prior to or in the absence of a finite mind, there is still a mic there which consciousness may or may not be able to perceive. I would suggest that is an, an assumption. I would suggest that the, that the mic only appears as a mic when it is perceived from the perspective of a finite mind. And in the absence of that perspective, the mic is not a mic. In fact, even when it is perceived, it is not a mic. It just appears to be. It's what the uh, uh, the activity of consciousness looks like from a localized perspective. So there's no question of whether infinite consciousness can or cannot see a finite object pr prior to the mind. That there are no finite object. There are no things prior to the to the arising of the finite mind. And even from the perspective of the finite mind, there are no real things. There are the appearance of things. What is it that is appearing? as things you mean to say there are no real separate things 
Like that the things exist in the sense that they're all... There are no things, period. Things are what the activity of infinite consciousness looks like from the localized perspective of each of our minds, just as what appear to be things in your dream, the buildings, the fields, the tiger, what appear to be things made of matter in your dream are what the activity of your mind looks like from the perspective of the dreamed character or avatar. There are no real things in the dreamed world. I would suggest there are no real things in this world. Okay. Okay, so let's the question the second question I had was with regarding the dreams anyway. When some people say that they're enlightened, now first of all, you can you or anyone can just dismiss that and say they think they're enlightened, but they're not. However, some people seem to be genuine when they say so and exude a sense of what one would think an enlightened person would look like, such as maybe yourself or Sadhguru. And if one was to take this enlightenment equals awakening seriously and this dream analogy seriously, then the reason why I think it's more accurate to say that it's like a dream. This world is like a dream, but not a dream in the sense that we know a dream. The reason why I'm putting that asterisk there is because in an actual dream, once you realize, oh, this is a dream, you wake up. Pfft, and then Mexico's gone. But when Sadhguru has an enlightened experience, it's not like he then vanishes and we just see his clothes fall on the ground. Yes. And then all of us collapse. So in this analogy, Kurt, what would be um, the equivalent of enlightenment would not be waking up and, and as a result, the dream coming to an end. It would be beginning to lucid dream in your dream. That would be the analogy. The dream carries on, but you no longer believe and feel that you are the localized subject of experience. You feel that you are the entire reality of the dreamed world. You're just perceiving it from a localized perspective. Now, in this lucid dream example, do people come back from enlightened experience, enlightened experiences where they feel like they have the the truth that this is, this whole place is some illusion? Do they come back with, I don't mean to be crass, but powers? When I lucid dream, I have the powers of flight. I can stare someone down and make them crumble or create. Obviously, I don't see that from Sadhguru, but are there some limitations they previously had that they can overcome that one would say would be impossible had not they realized that this was a dream? Like Neo from The Matrix. The, 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 there are undoubtedly... Uh, we, we must be open to the possibility that these kind of uh, unusual powers exist. However, I don't think they have anything to do with enlightenment. So, f first of all, I would never say, I would never claim that I or anybody else was or was not enlightened. It's not a phrase that I use. I would be very wary of anybody else who claimed it's to be... It's like saying I'm humble. It, it's, it's, like, it's like saying I'm humble, exactly. So, so it's not, in fact, it's a, a word that I never use, really, because like so many of these words... It has become so misunderstood and misused. But let let me let me offer a a, um, a definition, or, or there are many ways enlightenment could be defined. But let, let let me offer one very simple definition, and that what is traditionally called enlightenment or awakening would simply be the recognition of the nature of our essential self. It's not an extraordinary recognition. It doesn't make you an extraordinary person. It doesn't give you supernatural powers. It doesn't make you a saint. It just, it, 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 although it, it does have an effect on your experience because in recognizing the nature of your essential self or being, you recognize its qualities and its qualities then become your qualities. And the, the, the qualities, if we can call them qualities, its essential qualities are, are in, in relation to human experience, are, are peace and joy. So you say in the, relation it, it, to so human... Let me just say one more thing, Kurt. Kurt sorry. Yeah, sorry. So I'm sorry it, if I interrupt. It, no, I no, apologize. no, please, but I don't mind at all. Uh, I'm always interrupting you. Um, so in relation to a, a, a test for enlightenment, because your question started with, are, are these supernatural powers uh, uh, some kind of indication that enlightenment has taken place, uh, so-called enlightenment? the recognition of the nature of one's being, I would say no. If we want a test, we, we should look for it more in, in the extent to which we experience 
imperturbable peace and causeless joy in ourself. That, that would be a, a, a much more real test as to the extent to which this recognition of our true nature has taken place. I've heard you mention that this imperturbable peace, causeless joy, happiness, prosperity, maybe not prosperity, but inner prosperity, comes from, as you mentioned, the recognition that we are all connected into this one consciousness. In fact, even to say the word connected implies that we're different and connected by nodes. No, that it's just one vellum and maybe there are ripples on it, on this cloth. I heard you say that before, and you, by you nodding, I assume that you recognize that you have said that before. But then at the same time, there are some materialists, atheists, who say that they gain their peace and prosperity and calmness from a recognition of their finitude and disconnectedness, that I am going to die, and this is all I have. And for whatever reason, that brings them calm. They've surrendered to that, let's say. Susan Blackmore is someone who said that, and I believe Sam Harris has said that in some other way, shape, or form. What are we to conclude from that? Are they delusional? Are they simply saying that so that they can hold on to their materialist paradigm while still saying, look at the happiness that I have, so you as spiritual people are incorrect? Like, wh what do you think it is? Can it? Is that possible? I, I would ask them the question, what is it that knows your finitude? You claim that you know your finitude and that you are at peace with it. So my question is, what is it that knows your finitude? Is it okay if I go through this experiment please, right now? Not, please do, not saying no, that please, I'm please do because I would far rather Blackmore. explore this experientially than, than, than in an abstract. So, yes, so yes, 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 yes. You, you, okay, you, 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 please do. You, you, Whenever you're ready. Go okay. on, I'll tell close me, you, you, you feel that your thoughts are finite, your sensations, your, your body. You know your own finitude or your own limitations. What is it that knows that you are finite? Again, to say it with words is tricky, but it's this, I know you would call it awareness. I would just call it this, a being or a perspective. And I'm, the, I'm only, I'm trying not to steal your words. And no, no, no it but awareness. it's much better but that it, you, you try to use words. Right. Don't, don't use my. It also feels like, it also feels like. There's a bit of a vibration to it, but the vibration seems to extend to the entire universe. But at the same time, like I mentioned, I have a flashlight. I can't see beyond it, but it, I have a feeling that it extends limitlessly. But I also can't see beyond my beyond the limit, so I don't know for sure. And I have that feeling, and there's a bit of a undulating character to the... Now, this undulating character, series. this vibration, this is something you, that you are aware of. The fact that you can describe it. You didn't say it was hot or cold. You said it's undulating. It has some kind of objective form to it that enabled you to say it's undulating. It's not sharp or cold. So I would Correct. push you back a little further in your experience and ask you, what is it that is aware of this background undulation? That's such a tricky question, Rupert. I'm trying to I'm trying to get there, but what I essentially I mean, I think what you're asking is I think what you're trying to get me to do is to get to this point of pure awareness. And that's difficult. I have gotten to places like that before, but it takes me 20 minutes, 30 minutes to do so. You don't have to go there. It it's what you are. You 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 don't Okay, sorry. It takes me 20 to 30 minutes to recognize it then. Let's say that. But no, but what what it what it really takes you 20 or 30 minutes to do is to relinquish the objective content of your experience, to come back and back and back and back. That's a, that's a journey that you have to take. Each time you take it, the journey gets a little shorter. Okay, for the moment, it takes 15 or 20 minutes as you trace your way back through the layers of thoughts, feelings, activities and relationships. You, you came very quickly to this subtle undulation or vibration, I think you called it, but you have to go one step further back. 
to do so right now, or just you're telling me in the future? That, that that's you. That, that's what you were doing. That 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 in okay. in that silence, and and then and then after thirty, twenty, thirty seconds of silence, you said it's so hard to do this. No, what you mean is, it's so hard for me to say anything about that which knows my finitude. Why? Because there is nothing finite there to say anything about. So going back to your your question about those who claim that it is because they know their finitude that they are at peace. I would suggest that it, in order to know one's finitude, one must take one's, you, one can only know something that, with, that, that one has taken one's distance from. In order to, just as the eyes cannot see themselves, they can only see something at a distance from themselves. In order to say, I know that I am finite, that which knows that finitude cannot itself be finite. So by saying, I know my finitude and therefore I am at peace, these people are, without realizing it, taking their stand momentarily in their true nature. They then interpret that experience in line with their materialist presumptions. Is it possible to be enlightened and misinterpreted? So to get some truth? It, it or... Absolutely it is. Yes. It, it is possible to have uh, recognized the essential nature of oneself and for one's mind, in, in, by mind in this case I mean uh, the, the conceptualization of one's experience uh, to take some time to catch up. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, it's, it's not only one's concepts that take time to catch up with this recognition, it's also one's feelings in the body. There's a story I sometimes tell, forgive me if you've heard it already, about a, an old Zen master on his deathbed. And he was asked by one of his students, how, how is it for you now, Master? And he said, he said, everything's fine, but my body's having a hard time keeping up. By which he meant that, that in my interpretation of this story, by which he meant that, that his mind was clear and, and at peace, but the way he felt his body was, had not yet caught up with his his enlightened experience. So there was some disparity between his understanding and his felt felt sense of his body. Now it's also that that's very possible, but it's also possible for one's ideas, that the, the one's beliefs, to not to be in line with one's new so-called enlightened experience. It, it takes time for the mind. In fact, so-called enlightenment, and as I say, I don't really like the, the term, this recognition of the nature of our being is, is, is not the end point. I, I would suggest it, it was a, a stage. And after this recognition of the nature of our being, there is then what is for most people quite a lengthy process where our beliefs and feelings and perceptions are reorchestrated in a way that is consistent with this new understanding. And this takes time. In fact, it takes the rest of one's life. It reminds me of the classic case of a psychedelic episode or a breakthrough induced by a psychedelic, where one, while one is in that state, they have this feeling of extreme closeness to the truth that's drastically different than their previous conception. Then when they get out, they carry from that 100 pieces of information, maybe five, because it's also difficult to hold on to any of those ideas, but five are somewhat compatible. And then over the course of the next few months, they rearrange their lives to incorporate some of those five. Exactly, e exactly. So that there is this, this uh, recognition of, of uh, our true nature, which can either be just a, a, a temporary glimpse of our true nature, or it can be a permanent experience. But in either cases, the old habits of thinking and feeling are not immediately erased or reorchestrated as a result of this new understanding. They take time. If there is a, a, um, a ship on the ocean, when the, when the engine is turned off, 
the ship doesn't come to an immediate halt. There is a momentum behind it which will take it forward for some time, depending on the, 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 the weight and the speed. There is a momentum, the momentum of habit, to, to the way we think, feel, act, relate and perceive. And this momentum carries on after the recognition of our true nature and is in most cases gradually realigned with it. Can I go back to this question about the separation of one consciousness into two fundamentally different consciousnesses? Because you gave an argument as to why it can't be, but I don't think I restated it properly and I have it here so I could just have you listen to it. It is all empty of all I see you're, you're, you're playing myself back to me. Quality. Yes. Oh, heavens. <laughs> it has no finite qualities and is thus said to be infinite, not finite. Infinite, empty, not finite. There is nothing in it which can divide it. This is the part. If there were, for instance, two consciousnesses, there would, be have, there would have to be something about each of those two consciousnesses that divided or distinguished them from one another. And those distinguishing qualities would be finite limits. Okay. That's what I wanted to get at. And okay. What I'm curious about is why do they have to be finite limits? Like I mentioned, you have the R2 plane, you can still cleave it by putting an infinite line in between. So I don't see why an infinite line or a finite line makes any difference personally, but I, I'm curious, why does it have to be? What, what would enable you to say that they were two consciousnesses? For instance, in, in, is the space in your room, the, the, the kitchen that you're in now, is it, is it um, from a conventional perspective, is, is it one space or two spaces? It's one space. It's one space. Now, what about the, the, the space of your kitchen and the space of, let's, let me assume that your bedroom is next door? Sure, sure. Yeah, that's two separate spaces. Two separate spaces. Why? There's a wall between yes. them. If that wall was removed, would you still say it was two spaces? I understand what you're saying is that these lines are drawn arbitrarily, if that's what you're saying. Well, I, I, I'm saying that in our experience of consciousness, by which I mean consciousness is experience of itself, there is no limit. There is no line. Consciousness never has the experience of a limit within itself. It is like the aware space in our analogy earlier on, that cannot find the edge of itself. So in consciousness experience, in consciousness's experience of itself, it is, I would suggest, ever present and unlimited. So there can be no sectioned off sections of consciousness. We are, there Isn't can't be any real sectioned off parts of consciousness, but there can be the appearance of such a part. And you and I and everyone else is just such a sectioned off part, an appearance of a localized and apparently separate consciousness. That's why we feel I am a separate self. I'm a separate person or ego. That's what the ego is, the, the appearance and the corresponding feeling of being separate, temporary and finite. I would suggest that was an illusion, that that separation is an illusion and is the cause of suffering on the inside and conflict on the outside. Let me think about this. You said it's the cause of suffering. So I recall you saying that there's this infinite consciousness and we're a finite piece of it that thinks we're separate from it. And we think we're causing psychological suffering, but that's actually caused by the infinite consciousness pulling us toward it and not ourselves. I don't know if, firstly, tell me if what I said was correct. First of all, I would, I would suggest we have to back up a little bit. I would suggest that what we as human beings call the experience of happiness is the nature of consciousness. We can come back to that if you want to explore that. But let, let's take that as a possibility, that, that the nature of consciousness is what we call peace or happiness. Now, we apparently separate, localized, finite minds are 
a, a, a fragment or an apparent fragment of consciousness. We are a, a, a finite mind. And believing ourselves to be temporary and finite, we no longer feel ourselves as infinite consciousness and we no longer feel the nature of consciousness, which is happiness. So this apparent collapse of consciousness into a finite mind entails the overlooking of its innate peace and happiness. And that is why the finite mind or the separate self feels that it is a fragment, that it is incomplete, that it needs to be completed. And it seeks objective experience, that is objects, substances, activities, relationships, in order to complete itself. It doesn't really want the object. What it really wants is to be divested of its sense of separation and thus returned to its natural state of wholeness, which, from a human perspective, is conceptualized as happiness. Okay, let me ask a foolish question. Is there a reason, per se, that this infinite consciousness had to become finite? So is that a necessary... Yes, let's say that. Why is it becoming finite? I know you gave some examples with perspective, but let's anew. Uh, ultimately, the, I would suggest there is no reason, because any reason for manifestation would already be something manifest. If, 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 we, if we said the reason that infinite consciousness appears to itself in form through the agency of a finite mind, and it does so for this reason, and the reason is X, that reason would already be something manifest and could only be known from a localized perspective. So from consciousness's point of view, I don't think we can say there is a reason for creation. It is simply its nature. It, 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 it is its nature to move within itself. It is the nature of the ocean to to generate ripples within itself. It doesn't do so for a reason. It is just its nature to do so. Sorry, Kurt. There is only a reason, or there may only be a reason, from the localized perspective of a finite mind, which thinks in terms of time, space, and causality. But the time, space, and causality that it, in terms of which it thinks, do not pertain to consciousness. They are only true in it, from its localized and ultimately illusory perspective. Okay, so you seem to have, you say that with eloquence and with purposiveness. And I, I lack that because I, I don't have anywhere near the same security. So what I'm wondering is, if us as these finite beings are almost unable to discern motivations if there are such a thing as for the infinite being or its qualities in general aside from momentarily connecting with it and feeling peace aside from that then how can we say that time and causation and so on don't apply now let me see if this is the reason because if it was it would be as if there was something outside consciousness but in this theory there exists nothing outside consciousness is that it yes okay okay now as for the ripples if I was to just have a pond and let's remove wind because wind is outside an ocean and let's remove the ground and so on, then this glob of water wouldn't actually, wouldn't oscillate. There wouldn't be ripples. So it's actually the interaction of something outside it that causes ripples. This would be a, an, an ocean cut that spontaneously shuddered within itself and thereby generated ripples within itself, not due to some external cause. Obviously, the ripples on the surface of a lake is caused by something above the lake, namely the yes. wind. But, but th So this is a very imperfect analogy. But I would suggest that consciousness spontaneously shudders within itself, not for any reason. It is its nature to do so. And th this shuddering within itself generates what we could visualize as ripples and these ripples then um, multiply and diversify and become its activity which l later a a a appear from a localized perspective as the universe but these these early ripples 
the, these first, this first vibration, uh, the, 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 the very first uh, shuddering, the very first vibration of infinite consciousness is what is called, what is referred to in, in Greek philosophy as the Logos. In, in, in the New Testament it's referred to as the Word, the, the, the initial activity of infinite consciousness which later manifests as the universe. It's the it's it's the the logos, the primary, the primal sound, the primary vib vibration, which later multiplies and diversifies, and appears from a localized perspective as the universe. Is the logos the activity, so it's like a process, or is the logos the nature, and the laws? Let's it, say, it, it is its nature. To move within itself, it's not just silent, static, motionless. It is his nature to move, to vibrate within itself. And what is referred to as the the logos would be the first form of its activity, the the initial activity, the primary activity. But which which later will diversify, and and give give rise to what we know as the universe. In Christianity, at least in some interpretations, the Logos is around us even still, and we need to interact with Absolutely. the Logos. Absolutely. The, the, the Logos, the, the, the activity of, of consciousness, is actually what we are perceiving as the universe. Okay, hold on. Repeat that one more time, please. The, the Logos, the, the activity of consciousness, is what we are perceiving as the universe. It's not that it is around us. It is all that we ever experience. It just appears to us as, as, a, univ as a physical universe from the localized perspective of each I of see. our finite minds. So our finite minds are like a, a pair of glasses that we put on that, that renders the logos, renders the activity of infinite consciousness as a, a, an apparently material universe. Time and space are, are part of the apparatus through which we perceive. They are not the nature of that which is perceived. It is our finite minds that project or confer time and space onto reality. They are not inherent in reality. They're not fundamental to me. Sorry, sorry. No, I'm so sorry. Uh, there's, uh, obviously, there's a lag. So, uh, please, I hope you're not. You don't think I'm being rude. No, no, I, not, not I don't mean all. to interrupt. Not at all. Not okay. at all. I'm always and I'm enjoying this. Uh, I'm on. I'm. I feel it at such an ease, Rupert, that I. I've only felt with three people, and that is Bernardo Castro, so your kin, and then Ian McGilchrist, and I think there was one other person. Um, I, I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm very happy that you, you. You say that, Kurt. I also feel. Com Completely at ease. If I might say so, you're an extremely good interviewer. That the the, the 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 role of an interviewer is not, as you say, to be adversary and conflictual. It it is to somehow draw out from the interviewer what he or she knows, but without even well, knowing they that they knew. So it's a creative, dynamic process, and and um, so it. it it's mutual, and, thank, and I'm, I'm very you. touched that you say that about this kinship um, that was very evident in your conversation with with Bernardo. I haven't listened to your interview with Ian McGilchrist, which which I certainly will do because I haven't read all of his book, but I've read some of it, and I I, I just every single page, my my mind was 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 uh, it was resonating with, and I thought, oh, I, I would love to have a conversation with this guy sometime. And, I. I Ian McGilchrist's foreword alone, or preface alone, for The Master and Its Emissary, the second edition, that preface is its own book. That I had to, I listened to it while I was walking, so listened. I had to keep pausing and pausing yeah. and making yeah. notes. Yeah. Okay. So getting back, yes, I feel extremely calm with you. And I'm glad because usually what happens during these interviews is I'm looking up a person for two weeks straight, just watching all their videos, reading all their papers. And then when I see them, there's a bit of a surrealness to it because it was as if they were on, I, I at least unconsciously, at least unconsciously put them on a pedestal. And I'm not saying you're, I don't put you on a pedestal. I respect Good. and adore you, man. Good. But, Good. but I also feel, I feel, I, I feel, I feel like I don't have to 
overly try. I feel like I can, I can be myself. I, I'm very happy okay. to hear that. Good. And as for it, just a quick aside, as for what you say that I'm, I, as me as an interviewer, what I'm trying to do is actually, I'm actually just trying to understand what you're saying. And I'm trying to visualize and I'm trying to see, can I, how do I see it from that perspective? Because most of the time what I see from people like Michael Shermer, and I'm sure you, from Sam Harris and others, is that they have already an entrenched worldview, and then they're yes. trying to see how does it fit in, and if it yes. doesn't, then it's incorrect, so let me poke holes. But, but Kat, I think that's why, well, that's why I'm enjoying this conversation so much, and why I say I think you're, you're, you're very good at what you're doing, because you're not entrenched in, in a materialist perspective. Uh, you're very well acquainted with it, and... and but nor are you entrenched in a non-dual perspective. You you have a you're open to both, and so you're not entrenched anywhere. So you're 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 not making any presumption about either perspective, and that that makes for a very open conversation. Thank you, thank you. I'm just trying to understand it. That's all I'm trying to do. So anytime I if you feel like I'm attacking you, no, no, I, I don't. I, I feel entirely that you're trying to understand this in your okay. own experience. Okay, we'll get back to this. So where do you disagree with Donald Hoffman? And also, where do you disagree with Bernardo Castro? For example, they don't take some concept too far or they take some concept past this domain of applicability. I'm getting you to pick a fight with your friend. Yes, okay. I, I have to say, I, I find it hard to find anything I disagree with Bernardo about. Okay, how about Donald Hoffman? The little that you've seen of him. Uh, Donald, I, I, I met him once. I liked him very much. We, we had a, a, a good but brief conversation at a, at a conference. I haven't read his book, but I've watched a few interviews. So I've got a, I, I think, a, 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 and I've heard him speak live on a number of occasions. So I think I've got a, a, a reasonably good idea a, a, about his basic idea of... Um, conscious that, that reality is i think he would say a network of conscious agents or conscious experiences and i want to be very cautious because donald's not here to to correct me if i if i misrepresent him so i want to go very cautiously because i have great admiration and and, and respect for him and his work if i'm right that that he uh, has reduced reality to a network of conscious agents or conscious experiences. I would suggest that there's one step further to go, and that is to reduce this multiplicity and diversity of conscious agents or experiences into a single consciousness. And in fact, this was the one question we had dinner together once. He probably doesn't remember. It was the one question I asked him when we had a conversation is... is would he consider this a possibility? And he said very much so. He couldn't say for certain, but it was something he was exploring. Because let, let, let's take let's take the idea, and again, I may not be representing that Donald properly here. Sure. So let, let, let's be clear that what I'm talking about now is my very limited understanding of his idea of conscious agents or conscious experiences. Let's take this idea of a, a multiplicity of conscious experiences. Each experience must be different. So the experiences are different, just the fact that there are numerous experiences, each one must be different. However, there is something that is common to all the experiences, namely consciousness, because they are all conscious experiences. So consciousness is the common factor in each conscious experience. This is actually true of our experience. If you think of every experience that you've had in your life, every experience was different, but consciousness was the common factor in all of them. So, if I understand Donald correctly, this multiplicity and diversity of conscious experiences, consciousness is the, is the common factor in each of them. Now, how do we know that the consciousness that is the common factor in each of these consciousness experiences is a different consciousness? 
To me, that's like suggesting that every time you watch a different movie, you see it on a different screen. No, this, all movies share the same screen. I would suggest all experiences share the same consciousness, whether they are experiences that an individual mind has, or, if I understand Donald correctly, whether they are conscious experiences that are that, that exist beyond and outside of the, the, the finite mind. They still share the same consciousness. And for this reason, I would be interested to have this conversation with, with, with Don, whether he is open to the possibility that, that there is a common factor that unifies all these conscious agents or experiences, and that that is their fundamental reality, namely consciousness. So I'm not sure that that's a, a disagreement with Donald, because I, I'm not, I haven't understood his position well enough to, to see clearly how it differs from what I'm saying, but I think it's, what I'm saying is, is reasonably accurate. So that, that, that would be a difference. As I say with Bernardo, um, I feel this deep resonance with him. And what I, what I love about Bernardo, and that is very interesting about our, about our con where we meet, but, but both where we meet when, when we meet in, in person, but where our ideas meet, is that Bernardo and I have c come to this understanding through very different channels. He, he's, a, he, he's primarily a, um, a scientist, and he comes at, at this through, through the rigorous scientific method. And, and I didn't take that route. Uh, I went this route through primarily through in, introspection, through through the investigation of my own experience. So in me, in my experience, I, I explored my experience and my mind then had to catch up and indeed is still catching up and finding new ways to formulate my experience. Whereas in Bernardo's case, and I hope it's... Um, this is a reasonable thing to say. Bernardo, if he ever listens to this, will correct me if it's not. In Bernardo's case, his mind ran ahead of him. He came to this understanding through um, rational inquiry. And then his understanding, his felt experience, not his understanding, his felt experience, had then to catch up with his understanding. So in my case, I the 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 the, the, the the felt experience came first, and my mind had to catch up with that experience. He came into it the other way round. He came to this conclusion rationally, and since then, his experience has been catching up with it. And so that makes it, um, it makes our interaction uh, very interesting, because we're talking about the same thing, but we come at it through two very different perspectives. One through introspection and the other through rational rational analysis and empirical evidence I, I don't mean to imply that Bernardo has not introspected he he very obviously has but I think and I I think he would I, I hope I've characterized his process accurately and if I haven't then I, I apologize to, to to Bernardo what role does psychedelics play in spiritual understanding or getting to this connected state of infinite consciousness, is it warned against? Is it false? Is it a great aid? Is it not to be believed? You can speak personally, too, if you but like. I, I was just going to say that I, I can't really speak personally because I've had no personal experience of psychedelic drugs. The, the, when I, as I said at the beginning of our conversation... In my mid-teens, age 16, I started becoming very interested in these matters and I, I joined this school in London. It was a classical school of Advaita Vedanta, non-dual philosophy. And the one, one thing we were asked not to do, this was when I started to meditate, the one thing we were asked not to do was to take drugs. And I was an extremely passionate, keen, devoted student and I just did what I was told. Partly, having said that, it was not really my my character anyway, so I'm not sure I would have gone very far down that route. I probably would have gone a little bit further than I did, but I probably wouldn't have gone far down it. 
So I don't feel qualified to speak. I, I, I can't speak from experience. Can it be an aid? Well, it can certainly be an aid to, to making it absolutely clear how limited our finite minds are, how much more there is to our own individual mind than that narrow segment of it that is available to us in the waking state. Well, obviously, our dreams make it clear to us that there is very much more to our finite mind than is available to us in the waking state. But psychedelic experience from descriptions I've heard and read and heard from, from friends expands our, our sense of, of the content of our own individual mind. So from that point of view, it, it, it's obviously, um, it, it's, it's mind expanding. Can psychedelic experience tell us anything about the nature of consciousness? I would suggest not. In fact, I would go further and to su suggest that no objective experience, however extraordinary it may be, tells us anything about the nature of consciousness. It tells us about its activity, but not its nature. If we want to know about the nature of consciousness, there's only really one way to do it, and that is to go to the experience of consciousness, to go to the experience of being aware. Just as if I were to ask you now, tell me about the nature of the sensations at the soles of your feet, you would direct your attention to the soles of your feet. If I told you to tell me about your kitchen cooker, you'd direct your attention towards the kitchen cooker. If you want to know about the nature of consciousness, you have to give your attention to, the na to consciousness. So to go via psychedelic experience is at best a very long way around. Why not go there directly? Because everybody has the experience of being aware. It is within everybody, not just those of us that are philosophically minded or spiritually minded. It is within the possibilities of all 7.8 billion of us to go directly to the experience of being aware and recognize for ourselves its nature. Does something special happen when you're truly just aware of your own awareness? The reason I'm asking this is that if, imagine... This is an analogy. So but imagine this is your awareness. And, and sorry, this is your awareness. It can look at the kitchen, but it can also look at the garbage can and it can look at the washroom and your shoes or your feeling in your gut. Okay. Then I say, be aware of your awareness. So I am now I'm looking at my awareness here. Like the, for whatever reason in this foolish analogy, there are two awarenesses. I imagine that it would only grow stronger and stronger because as you're aware of your awareness, you become aware that you're aware of your awareness, which then leads you to become aware that you're aware of the aware of the aware of the awareness and onward to infinity. No, it's not an infinite regress, Kurt, because you, it, it, uh, uh, awareness is aware of itself. Its nature is to be aware of itself for the same reason that, that the sun illuminates itself but by nature. It doesn't have to do something special. It doesn't have to turn round and reflect its own light off the moon in order to illuminate itself. It, it, it illuminates itself by itself. Its, its nature mm -hmm. is illumination. So awareness is the same. It, it is like the sun. It, it, it knows itself simply by being itself. In, in other words, awareness is, is simply self-aware by nature. It, it, it is only when... Awareness localizes or contracts or seems to localize and contract into a finite mind, that it seems to overlook the nature of itself and there, as a result, has to take the journey back to itself and become aware of itself again as it is. Now, let me give you an, an analogy, which you've probably come across, but it's a very good analogy for this for this question. It's... it's, it's um, it's an analogy that I use a lot. Uh, and it's the analogy of the actor, an actor called John Smith, who plays the part of King Lear. Uh, are, are you familiar with this? And you've, yeah. you've heard, okay, well, let, let me just very briefly elaborate well, do it. it through for, for the let, audience. Let, let me do it for, for your audience. So um, in this analogy, John Smith represents consciousness 
King Lear represents the finite mind. Now, John Smith is, um, he, he lives alone at home in his apartment and he has a, a peaceful, happy life. He, he, he's content in his life. He goes to his theatre, he adopts the character of King Lear. He puts on, he not only puts on King Lear's clothes, but he adopts King Lear's thoughts and feelings. So he seems to become King Lear without ever actually ceasing to be John Smith. But his knowledge of himself as John Smith is eclipsed or at least partially veiled by his assuming the role of King Lear. Now, as soon as he seems to become King Lear, his innate peace and happiness are veiled and he suffers. He's uh, squabbling with his three daughters. He has trouble in the Kingdom of England. He's at war with France. He's miserable. So, at the end of the performance, uh, King, Le King Lear goes backstage. His friend comes to meet him to congratulate him on his performance, but is surprised to find him miserable. He asks him why he's miserable, and King Lear says, I'm miserable on account of the war with the French, my relationship with my daughters, and so on. And his friend says, no, don't be silly. You're not, you're not miserable for any of those reasons. You're miserable because you've forgotten who you truly are. Who, who are you? And then King Lear begins to to, to um, describe who he is. He said, I, I'm, I'm the father of three daughters. I'm the king of England. I'm at war with the France. And his friend says, no, don't be silly. These are, these are not who you are. These are just temporary roles that you play. Who, who are you before you assumed any of these roles? And then King Lear starts describing his, his thoughts, his relationships, his, his activities, his memories and his feelings. No, his friend says, but, but, but these are likewise are not essential to you. They are added to you. Go deeper into yourself. Who are you really? And, and he's teaching King Lear self-inquiry. He's teaching him how to meditate. He's going, he's in, his friend is encouraging him to, to um, discard everything that is non-essential to him. And at some point, there is this recognition, I am John Smith. At that moment, his suffering comes to an end. Now, it's not King Lear that has the recognition, I am John Smith. It is John Smith that has the recognition, I am John Smith. Now, to answer your, your question was, does something extraordinary happen when we recognize our true nature? Well, it, the recognition of our true nature is the most ordinary, intimate, familiar experience there is. It is not something extraordinary. It, on the contrary, it is the most intimate and familiar experience there is, albeit veiled most of the time by the content of experience. So what happens from King Lear's perspective, what happens on this recognition? He's relieved of his suffering. That's the extraordinary thing that happens on so-called enlightenment. We are relieved of suffering because our suffering arose in the first place as a result of the overlooking or forgetting of the nature of our essential self or being. This essential self slash being, you said that its nature is love and happiness and peace. Well, it, uh, on the inside, is that necessarily, okay. it's experienced as its nature is experienced on the inside as peace and happiness. Then, it's ex to know it as love requires a further step. So, and the, the John Smith King Lear analogy doesn't work for this. We have to go back to the dream analogy. When John Smith re recognizes himself as John Smith, his innate peace and happiness are restored. His suffering comes to an end. Revert now to the dream analogy. When we wake up in the morning, we realize that the essential nature of the avatar, the dreamed character, and the essential nature of all the other people in the dream is the same. Now that recognition that, that we share our being, that we are the same self or being, that is, from a human experience, 
that recognition of our shared being is felt as love. Now, we can go further than that. When we wake up in the morning, we recognize that we don't, that the, the being of the, the avatar, the dreamed character, is not only shared with all the other people and animals in the dream, it's also shared with all the other inanimate objects. Now, the recognition that we share our being with other people and animals is felt from the perspective of a human being as love. The recognition that we share our being with inanimate objects is felt from the perspective of a human being as the experience of beauty. Well, that's what the experiences of love and beauty are. They are the collapse of the subject-object relationship and the revelation of our shared identity. Would the squirrel, if it could, comprehend the connection that it has to other beings, would it necessarily feel it also as love? Or is this just a human construct or we don't know? Or if a tree or some cloud experienced oneness, recognized oneness, I mean, is it always guaranteed to be a feeling of love or peace? No. I would suggest that the... The, the, the way in which we experience... Re the, the, the reality that we experience is always the same reality. But what we call it depends upon the pathway we take towards it. If we take the pathway of thinking, mm -hmm. if we access reality through the pathway of thinking, we refer to it as truth or understanding. If we take the pathway of feeling or devotion, we refer to the same reality as love or happiness. And if we take the approach the same reality through the path of perception, as does an artist, we refer to that reality as beauty. In other words, truth, love and beauty are three different names for the same reality, depending on the path we take to that reality. Now, a different kind of mind may have different channels by which or through which it would approach the same reality, in which case it would describe that reality in terms that were consistent with that pathway. And we have to be open to the possibility that there may be other kinds of minds, and therefore there would be other ways to conceptualize this reality. But the actual experience itself would always be the same experience. And that is why when we experience love, we invariably experience truth and happiness with it. When we experience beauty, we invariably experience understanding and love with it, because really they are the same experience. But it's just that the truth, love or beauty aspect predominates depending on which channel we have approached reality through. Are there ever any untruths in non-dualism? The reason I ask this is it sounds dualistic to say that there exists truth and falsity, but at the same time it sounds like what you're saying is there's some worldviews that are correct it, it, and it, for, from the that aren't. perspective of non-duality, there is not really truth and falsity. There is just truth, just reality, and the veiling of reality. From the point of view of non-duality, there is not happiness and suffering. From a conventional point of view, happiness and suffering are two equal and opposite emotions that fluctuate one with the other. That's the conventional point of view. From the non-dual perspective, there is not happiness and suffering. There is happiness and the veiling of happiness, but always only happiness. There is truth or the veiling of truth, which from the limited perspective of a human mind appears as falsity. But there's no, there's no real 
suffering. There's no real ignorance. There's no real evil. When you say real, for example, there's no real suffering. What do you mean? That suffering doesn't have a stand-alone existence. Suffering is the, the veiling of happiness. So it's experienced as suffering. It feels like suffering. But if we were to touch the stuff that suffering is made of, if you go deep enough into the experience of suffering, you don't find an, an essential suffering. What you find is happiness. Suffering was just the veiling of that happiness. Okay, I think that's a great time to give an exercise because I don't, I can't comprehend that theoretically nor experientially. So please, perhaps you can help me with one of those routes. How is it that if one was to investigate their suffering to the utmost degree, they'd find happiness at the end of it? And also when you say happiness is veiled, well, what I, from what I'm understanding, there's only consciousness that exists and consciousness is nature, is happiness, love, joy, truth, beauty. So is happiness veiling itself? So that well, happiness plus happiness yes, equals yes, suffering? Yes, yes. Uh, <clears throat> Which do you, do you like John Smith or the dream analogy best? I I had an issue with John Smith. Okay, let, let, let's use I, the dream analogy. I, so okay. w w w when you fall asleep at night, you, you've you you've just had a lovely meal with a friend. You're feeling peaceful and happy. You go to sleep at night, but you dream you're being chased by a tiger. You're ter You have a nightmare. You're terrified in your dream. So the innate happiness of your mind, albeit in this case your finite mind. Um, was veiled by its own activity. The nightmare was not imposed on you from outside. You were happy when you fell asleep, but your own mind veiled its own state of happiness and assumed the form of a nightmare. Now, that if you touch the stuff that nightmare was made of, it was made out of your own mind, your own inherently peaceful mind. So yes, consciousness, it, it veils itself with its own activity. Just like, uh, just to thoroughly mix my metaphors, in, in, in a movie, a two-dimensional screen appears as a three-dimensional landscape. The three-dimensional landscape is an illusion, but it's an, it, it's an appearance of its reality, the two-dimensional screen. So it, it is, if we could call the movie the activity, of the screen, that the, the screen veils its two-dimensional nature with its activity, which makes it appear to be a three-dimensional landscape. In other words, the screen veils itself with itself, with its own activity, which in reality is no real veiling. It's an illusion of veiling. That's why in the Vedantic tradition, they don't talk about ignorance. They talk about the illusion of ignorance. And that's going back to our conversation about suffering being unreal. It, it's, we could say it is the illusion of suffering. Now, I have to be very careful saying this because I do not mean to, to disrespect or disregard the very real experience of suffering that people have. All I'm suggesting is that if one goes deeply into the experience that we feel as suffering, we find happiness or peace at its source. Practically speaking, how does one go deeply in it? What one, one brings the... No, normally when we suffer, we are... I'll, I'll give you an example. Sorry, I That's think right. it'll be much clearer. Yeah. It's a personal one. I, I find that when... See, I'm so torn, Rupert, between almost every single person that I interview and their theories and as to what's right. And I'm trying to make sense of this whole, but it doesn't feel many people make analogies with jigsaw puzzles and they see how the pieces fit together. But for me, it's more like they're a golem offry. They're just jumbled in the air, twisting and turning. And I don't see how they fit. I get intimations every once in a while, but it's not like I can take a new piece and slot it in. However, I do have, like I mentioned, intimations or first reactions when it comes to people saying that you are God, if you were to investigate it, you're God that has forgotten your God. If I'm honest, there's some terror associated with that for me. And I'm not sure where the source of this comes from. I, I, 
I think it may be that I'm afraid one that would make me arrogant, like, oh, I'm God, and you don't realize you're God. But two, that it would drastically change me because I don't know what lies on that other side. Maybe I res maybe I give up all my possessions and I love my wife. And I wonder how much is my love of my wife holding me back in that sense from a larger truth because it should come God first and then your marriage. And you should, well, that's the story of Abraham is even above your kids. God is first. And I'm afraid of... I'm a, I, I had an experience about a year and a half ago or two years ago where I was convinced that what I was experiencing was, was true reality and true reality was that I'm not even in control of my body. There's something else in control. In fact, I was on a computer typing and it said, haha, you thought you were in control, but I didn't type that. Something was talking to me through my fingers that terrified me. And then I was alone. I was pacing around in my in this condo, and I was thinking, what if that other part of me, like God, if I'm driven by, I must accept the truth no matter what it is, which is what I used to be driven by. Now I think that sometimes the truth is so harsh to say you'll accept all truths is you should be a bit more humble. There are plenty of truths you won't accept, even if you should, because they're destabilizing and damaging, at least in the short run. I remember I was walking around here and thinking, I don't want to kill myself. Now, I'm not suicidal, but I meant I don't want this part of my brain to somehow convince me to kill myself. What do I do? And then I had to call an ambulance. I was so calm speaking to them. I remember speaking to a cop who had a gun and I said, I just want you to know I don't want to die. I actually don't want to die. I'm not, I'm not suicidal. I'm not depressed. But I have this feeling that what I'm living right now is this life over and this will keep continuing to play, which resonated with some of the Vedic texts, and that even if I die now, this was the time for me to die. I had to call my wife. She just never had a more stressful day in her life than that because she can't, well, it's scary to hear that all of a sudden someone wants to kill themselves when there was no sign of this before, and I didn't want to, but I'm saying I didn't know if I would, so I had and since then, I've been afraid of certain truths because I know how powerful they can be. And I don't, I, I don't want to become Abraham. I don't want to listen to God or whatever I think is God above all else if it tells me to do something that harms myself or harms my wife or gets me to renounce all that I love, which is my life right now, which means that I'm extremely attached to my life right now, which is maybe the source of the suffering. But I'm afraid what will happen? Yes. What will happen if I go on that other side? So now that's the example. How does one like myself push through that suffering to find happiness on the other side? Okay. Can, can I offer an interpretation of, of, of what you've just suggested, this, this fear of, of death, fear of killing yourself? You, 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 you're obviously very deeply interested in, in these matters and have explored them in, in, in your own way, obviously, uh, for a long period of time. And you've had many intuitions about truth or, or, or reality. And I, I would suggest that th these intuitions or recognitions of the nature of reality in you have... Uh, caused you to understand that something in you has to cease in order to totally accept and live the reality or the truth that you intuit. What is that something that must cease? Your sense of yourself as a temporary, finite, separate self. So there is an intuition that something in you must die, must come to an end, must cease, if you were to go more deeply into this exploration of truth or reality. However, I would suggest that this intuition that something in you must not really does die, but dissolve if you were to go further into this exploration, has been appropriated by your old materialistic conditioning. And you have conflated the two. 
and interpreted this intuition that something must dissolve in you as the belief and the fear that I am going to die physically. You're not going to die physically. However, there is some truth in your reality, in, in your intuition, that something in you is going to dissolve. What is that? The sense of being temporary, finite, limited, separate. It is that feeling, that the feeling of being temporary, finite, limited and separate, that veils your innate happiness on the inside and your experience of love on the outside. The belief and the accompanying feeling that you are temporary, finite, limited and separate. The further you go towards truth or reality, the more that belief and the associated feeling is going to dissolve. So you're, it, it's true, if your identity is invested in your sense of yourself as a separate self, that feels, from the point of view of a separate self, like a kind of death, and people fear it. But all, you're going to, all that's going to happen is that you're going to be divested of the limits that you previously assumed were essential to yourself. And as a result of this dissolution of those limits, your innate peace on the outside, on the inside, and the experience of love, the experience of your shared being on the outside, will be magnified in your experience. So you won't lose your love of your wife. On the contrary, it will get stronger. In fact, your feeling of your shared being with everyone will get stronger. But you will lose your attachments. You're saying if I was to kill myself, I would lose them? No, no, no. no. If you were to go further into your, your love of truth or reality. I see. I see. Because the more deeply so you I'm go afraid. in... Go on, go on. Sorry, the core... I think a core fear is actually that I want to be driven by pursue love and truth always 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 never lie especially never lie love i can i can do though i wouldn't be so arrogant to say that i'm a loving person i try to be truth is tricky because i don't like i'm saying what if the truth is revealed to me that i should kill myself or my wife or i don't know what kind of truth it could be but but that's that's what worries me and I, if I understand what you're saying, it's Kurt, still listen to the truth. It won't steer you wrong. Yes. Re remember, Kurt, one of the inevitable consequences of the recognition of our essential nature or being is that we begin to feel that we share our being with everyone and everything. And as a result of this, it becomes intolerable to us to do anything that hurts another being because we literally feel that that being is ourself. If you look at all, the, all those people who perpetrate a cruelty or violence or injustice on another person, they have to consider that other person separate from themselves in order to enable them to behave towards them in that way. One doesn't behave in that way towards the people one loves. Okay, let me let me see if I can poke a hole and then you, you can patch it right back up. I think that plenty of what motivates people is self-hate. And if you see the connection that you have with others, I don't see that as necessarily engendering love, but you can just see that as a way of promulgating more hate and suffering. And the reason is that often when you hate and you harm, destroy others, you're doing that to yourself as well. And you can even consciously do that to yourself because you dislike yourself and you dislike the world. And so in some ways you can see the, let's say the self-hater, which is which I would say characterizes all of us to different degrees. And it's something that I see missing in plenty of the more spiritual talks that I hear is this recognition of the malice inside and cruelty and sadistic nature of people. This, it's, there seems to be the claim that once we become aware that we're connected and that love is abound, 
that we would drop our egotistical and tormenting ways. But I don't necessarily see that to be the case, especially given some of the writings of serial killers, as well as even introspection into myself. Sometimes what I do, sometimes I know if I'm being bitter, I'm not saying it happens often, but I'm just being honest though. If I'm bitter, I'll often do what's wrong knowing I'm doing what's wrong. And here's like a simple example. If I'm fighting with my wife, which we rarely fight, but squabble, let's say. I'm a girl and I... I try to re I retreat because why? Because I'm such a little wimp that I want her to come to me and say, Kern, no, like, I'm sorry, babe. But I need to be the one that says sorry. I need to, first of all, not go away. But while I'm doing that, I know this, you shouldn't be doing this. Follow love. What would Christ do? And Christ would not do that. I'm not strong enough. I'm not strong enough. So even there, I know I'm harming her, myself, but I still do it. And, and I'm not a serial killer. So you can just take that to the extreme with them. Next time you're squabbling with your wife, Kern, before you engage in the well, whatever the issue is or anything, just, just try feeling that that you share your being with her, that her being literally is your being. Yes, your, 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 your bodies are separate, your ideas are separate, your feelings are separate, or at the level of appearances that there are, there are two entities there. But feel that underneath that appearance, there is a, a shared reality, your being. Feel that. I know you understand that or you, you intuit this, but feel it. And then allow that feeling to inform the conversation. See where the argument goes. Even right now, I feel love toward her as I just imagine that. Now, can you imagine exactly even just d doing this thought exercise is Honestly. enough to generate in you this feeling of warmth and love towards your wife? Now, imagine doing this with her as this the, some familiar argument begins and before the argument escalates and develops into a three-hour standoff or a three-day standoff or a three-week standoff, whatever it, yeah, it is. Yeah, luckily it's not like that. Okay, but, but, but imagine that, that uh, early on in the process, you just paused. You paused the train of thinking and talking. You paused and you, you did just, it, it takes a few moments. We did it for a few moments. And you were to mm -hmm. not just understand intellectually, but feel th th this being is my being. It is myself. To, to feel that. And then to allow the subsequent conversation to be informed by that feeling. What would happen? What would be the dynamic of the conversation as a result of that? Okay, I'll give you two answers. One that occurs to me as a, as a somatic impression, like my bodily feeling is love. And then number two, I'm torn intellectually because... If she's me, and I'm being pleasant toward her, and loving and so on, is that a selfish act? Shouldn't I be unselfish? Shouldn't it be loving if I think of her as separate and still do unto her positively, regardless of its connection to me? So I'm, I'm torn there. One, like I, I feel the love, like you mentioned, but two, is this right? And it reminds me of the classic difference between Satan and God, where Satan wants to be God. He wants none above him. He wants to be the the master. And that's considered to be blaspheming, at least in... And this shows up not just in Christianity, in different ways, and forms and metaphors. But then, if I am God, if I analyze myself enough, I am God, then it turns out Satan was right. He is God. And so, which one's correct? Which one's the tr which one's the sin? I, I, I Am would, I God? Is it not? Yeah. I would you suggest understand. that the, the the separate self or the apparently separate self simply cannot act in loving ways, because it is by definition separate. It, and, and love and, is and by the definition connection. The extent to which it does seem to act in loving ways is the extent to which its actions are 
whether it realizes it or not, informed by its intuition of the being that it shares with the other. Rupert, I have a question about when you give speeches, because something I've noticed that's striking to me is the pauses in your voice when you're on stage, even when we're talking now, but I'm pausing as well, and there's a different character to it. Is there a reason for it? So for, are you thinking? Are you experiencing pure consciousness? Kurt, it, it's completely spontaneous. It's, it's sometimes, as you've noticed in our conversation, I I can't even wait for you to finish your sentence. And I, I, I've i intuited where you're going and I'm already, I, I just can't wait to get a response out. I'm the so same way. I'm, I'm quite capable of that. But uh, on other occasions, you ask me something and the, the answer doesn't readily come. And I don't, so... I. I I don't want to refer back to the past to find an answer because then my answer would be like would be like eating tinned food. It wouldn't be it would fill you up but it wouldn't be nourishing. So that's, that's extremely interesting. I want to pause and I want the answer to come out of the current experience. I want it to come fresh out, as a as a as a unique response to you in this moment. And I want to give time for that response to emerge. Now, sometimes that response, as I said, it, it, it's there even before you finished your sentence. But on other times, it, it doesn't come immediately. And then I pause, I wait. I'm not thinking out the answer. I, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting. Are you praying? Or are you well, simply it, silent it, and if, waiting for if by praying, a bubble to appear? Yeah, exactly. If by praying you mean being silent and open, then I'm praying. And actually, I would suggest that was the the deeper aspect of prayer, being 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 open and silent. So in a way, it's a kind of prayer, by, not a prayer directed towards someone or something, but just an openness. It's like a, a silent invitation that my understanding, such as it is, might tailor itself uniquely to your question. And it may need some time before that response emerges. And so I just wait in this attitude of, of openness. But it's spontaneous. It's never calculated. Or it's, just, it's just spontaneous. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. How, this cosmic, I don't know if you have a name for it, like mind at large is Bernardo's. This infinite consciousness can it speak to us in the form of intimations, maybe hints, adumbrations, feelings, absolutely, or absolutely. even literally? It, it is, it is speaking to us all the time, all the time. It is speaking to us. One of the most common ways it speaks to us is in our desire for happiness. Everybody who is not fully happy desires happiness. Most people are most of the time seeking happiness to a degree. Now, most people feel I as a separate self am seeking happiness. No, the separate self is an illusion. It doesn't do anything. It is the happiness of our nature that is pulling us back to itself. It is happiness that is seeking us we are not seeking it. So the desire for happiness would be one example of infinite consciousness constantly calling out to the finite mind, saying, come back to me. I am what you are looking for. Stop looking for me in objects, substances, activities, relationships. I'm not there. Turn round. Come back to me. So yes, the, 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 as soon as we have contracted or seem to have contracted into a finite mind, almost everything in our experience is a message from the infinite telling us, come back to me. Our desire for, a, a, a scientist feels it as their desire for truth, an artist feels it as their love of beauty, a, 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 a suffering person feels it as their love of, 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 of happiness. Uh, yes, it, it's speaking to us all the time. Why is it 
that suffering exists. I'm not talking about the problem of evil necessarily. I would suggest that suffering was. It, it was the it, it's the fallout. It, it's the. It's the inevitable. It, it's it's back up a little bit. We said earlier. I suggested earlier that that infinite consciousness cannot know manifestation directly. It can only do do so through the agency of a finite mind. So in order to in order to rest in its own being, consciousness doesn't need to do anything. John Smith can just stay at home. But in order to manifest its potential within itself, it has to localize itself within its own activity and view itself from a localized perspective. Now, the price it pays for doing so is the overlooking of its true nature. So I would suggest that suffering is the price consciousness pays for creation. And that is why, at the heart of all individuals, apparently finite selves, there is this longing for happiness. That is the deepest part of an individual, this longing for happiness. What we're really longing for is not the object, the substance, the relationship. We are longing to be divested of everything that seems to make us limited and as such returned to our natural condition. This, this is extremely interesting because it says that, that suffering is part and parcel of existence, existence as far as we know it in our finite conception of it. Okay, I need to think about that. As for well, there's different kinds of suffering. There's the psychological torment, in which I imagine you're referring to, but then there's also acute physical pain, which I don't imagine you're referring to. And I would like an explanation as to why that exists. You're right, Kurt. I, I make a, a distinction between, a clear distinction between psychological or emotional suffering and physical pain. We all know, both from our own experience and from our observation of others, that it's possible to be happy in pain or discomfort. And, and vice versa. And, and, and vice versa. So, right. so there's a connection between the two, but 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 it's it, it's right. And the connection is so strong. I don't know if you know that if you have heartbreak, you can take Tylenol, and it'll ease your heartbreak. Yes. Well, the, 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 and and th this this makes sense because there is a well, what I'm what I'm saying now is a is a concession to the belief that there are two entities, a mind and the body. But this is a, that's because there is a close connection between the mind and the body. Now, at a deeper level, we can't even say there's a close connection between the mind and the body because they're not two things to be connected in the first place. They are just two different views of the same reality. Okay, now getting back to where physical pain fits into this. Why is it there? I understand the longing or the separation of the infinite from the finite is perceived as a pull toward happiness. Okay, well, physical... Just as I would suggest the experience of suffering is a call from the deepest aspect of ourself to the, the, the superficial, the more superficial aspect of ourself, the, the sense of being a separate self. It is a call that, that we have mistaken ourself for a collection of thoughts, feelings, memories, images, sensations. It is a call to ourself to come back to ourself. So the experience of suffering is like a signal an intelligent signal from the depths of our mind telling us you have overlooked your true nature. You have lost yourself in the content of your experience. Come back. Turn round. Come back. So although suffering is painful, it is an intelligent signal of the mind telling us we have overlooked ourselves. We have forgotten who we truly are. Now, pain would be the corresponding experience at the level of the body. Yes, it's unpleasant, but it's supposed to be unpleasant. It is an intelligent signal from the body saying something needs attending to. Now imagine if the experience of pain was pleasant. We would 
we would enjoy hunger and thirst. We would never be motivated to take our hand out of the fire. The human species would have come to an end millennia ago. No, pain is supposed to be painful. It's supposed to be because it's a signal, an intelligent signal from the body, letting us know that something needs doing for the, for, for the purposes of preserving the body. Now, of course, that's crediting the body. That's looking at the body from the conventional perspective. It's crediting the body with a, 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 an independent physical existence of its own. I would suggest that the body is just what the finite mind looks like, from a localized perspective. So at a deeper level, the, the, the um, experience of pain is to do with maintaining the integrity of the finite mind. It's, it's, innate, it, it, it's innate impulse to maintain its integrity as an apparently separate localized consciousness. I understand that up to a certain level. Let's say you stub your toe. I stubbed my toe the other day. It hurt like, man, that was one of the worst pains I've ever felt. Weeks after I couldn't go for walks and I love walks. Okay, so that was painful. but And that was extremely painful. But then I can imagine, that's just my toe. Imagine I hit three toes at once or on different. And imagine someone torturing someone else, which that to me is as far as it goes. And you can torture someone like like mad. You can harm them like crazy. Why is that bound? Why is the bound not at the stubby toe? Because that to me is enough to run away from virtually any signal. Like that is horrible. Move away from there. Okay, I understand that with this amount of pain of the stub toe. Let's call that an 8 out of 10 pain. But why is there 11 out of 10 or 20 out of 10 pain, such as someone getting skinned alive or the raping of your wife in front of you and your intestines being pulled out? And I know, but this has all been done. Whatever you can imagine, Rupert, in your create, darkly creative mind that has been done by people to other people or to other animals. So why does suffering have to get so large? Because to me, if it was purely an informative signal, it could do its job at that 8 out of 10. Additionally, if you're on a computer and you're debugging code, there's no pain associated with it. It just says error, and then you're like, okay, I need to fix this up. So it could also be like, it could be some mixture. I don't see why it has to be suffer unbounded suffering. So please, expl take that in and let me know what you think about what I just said. Can I respond at the level of suffering rather than physical pain, at least to begin with? We could ask the same question. Why are there degrees of suffering? Why is it not, why is it not enough? Let, let me give you an experience for, from my own personal life. And so this happened, I must have been 20, 21, 22. So I was already very interested in these matters. I'd been meditating for several years and... I was exploring the non-dual philosophy in the Advaita tradition. But uh, when I was uh, 22, I was deeply in love um, with, 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 a, with a girl. I just presumed in my naivety and innocence that we would get married and live happily ever after. That was certainly what I wanted to do. And we had been together for about three years or so. And um, she called me one night and in a two-minute conversation, broke off the relationship, hung up. That was it. That was the end of it. And that, that, that night, after the initial kind of wave of sorrow began to subside, I became aware of how profoundly I had invested my happiness in the content of my experience, in this case, in a relationship. And I, for the first time, I... As I say, I had been interested in, the, in these matters for some time, but, but this intensified my interest. For the first time, I, I asked myself, in, in what can one reliably invest one's desire for happiness? This was such a shock, such a wake-up call. Now, you would have thought that that would be enough for me, because this was really intense, and it was very clear to me that I had invested my happiness in something which is by definition temporary and fleeting. It became clear to me how mad it is to seek lasting happiness in something that is as fragile and fleeting as a relationship. Why didn't my desire for happiness in objective experience end abruptly 
with that experience? Why did it take another 20 years for that impulse to finally wind, wind down? When I had seen it so clearly that night, Rupert, it is madness to invest your May I ask how old you were when this happened? I was 21, possibly 20. Uh, uh, so I it was, took you almost no, 20 I, I years was 20. to get over that? I, I, I was 20. It didn't take me 20 years to get over it. It didn't take me a while to get over it. Um, but no, it took me. It took me another. It took me another fifteen years, for for the for the impulse to seek happiness in objective experience, to 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 wind down, to come to an end, in spite of that clear recognition. I was age. It was twenty, in, in spite of the clear recognition, age twenty, that it is to 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 seek happiness in objective experience, is to set oneself up for disappointment and failure. I saw that clearly for the first time in my life. And yet that moment of clear seeing was not enough to put the habit to an end. It, okay, in other words, you intellectually understood it, but your body no, didn't it was, follow? No, it was more than intellectual. I, I understood it to the depths of, of my being. But I needed further bouts of suffering. I needed to invest my desire for happiness in objective experience again and again and again and again and to experience the repeated failure and disappointment of that investment for, 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 for this impulse to, to gradually wind down. So, so I'm trying to answer your, your question as to why isn't a, 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 a single... Okay, it was a fairly intense experience, but on the spectrum of possible experiences, it gets a lot worse. So, you know, let's say it was five on, on, on the spectrum. It, it, sure, I can sure. think of far worse things. My, than, my toll was worse. No, I'm just well, kidding. That was a physical thing, but I can think of far mm. worse causes for psychological suffering than, than, yeah, than your girlfriend child, ditching you say. and losing a child. Yeah. I mean, you know, what I experienced barely registers on the scale compared to what some people experience. But, but why wasn't that experience enough? Why was it necessary to not necessarily have more intense experience of suffering, but in my case, numerous such experiences before I finally got the message? So I, I'm just giving this as a, uh, as a model in relation to suffering and, and then transpose it to, to physical sensations it's of course you can't really account for for torture in this in, in this model again this is this is presuming a, a kind of conventional ahead, materialistic fine. view of the body but the, the 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 intenser the pain the greater the extent to which the integrity of the body is threatened i i, I don't even want to to mention you know s s some of the some of the extreme forms of, of violence and the intensity of pain is obviously unimaginable but but also the integrity of the body is profoundly threatened in those moments the integrity of your body was not threatened by your stubbing your toe and therefore the pain pain i know it was bad but compared to some of those other yeah it it, it probably course, wasn't course, five course, or six it was probably no, no, one it was or two. nothing it was nothing yeah 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 I know you have to get going, and I no, I'm, I'm so long, fine. Uh, I could I could talk with you all night, like all night like this. <laughs> uh, then is it okay if I ask you a couple other yeah, sure. questions? I can sure, even sure. give you the overview, and you can okay. Sure. Yeah. Because there's so much, so much more. I feel like we, I have to have a second conversation with you at some point, sure, maybe a course. few months or a of year, course. Of because course. plenty of what you've given me is not just what I should think about, but what I should practice or what I should focus or not focus on. And that to me, if I want to do that properly, will take at, at least weeks and mo most likely months and years. But I can at least come to you after I've made some progress. I remember you saying that the reason scientists or the materialists think that there's an objective world is because there's 
at least for us humans, there's some part of our consciousness that is shared, and we call that shared world the objective world. However, I don't think that's the main reason why scientists or materialists think that there is an objective world. I think it's that coupled with that no two people or no three people share a realm, at least not consistently in a way that's communicable to a larger group. For example, you can't just take people into separate rooms and say, think of a number from 1 to 1,000, and then they're all going to be the same consistently. So that is to say, let me restate that. Yes, in this model of consciousness, in your model of consciousness, we have overlapping consciousnesses, at least different realms, and then it's this realm that we call the objective world. The existence of the objective world doesn't negate the rest of consciousness, which is what materialists do. But I recall you saying that the reason materialists think there's only the objective world is because of the overlap. But I'd say it's, it's the overlap as well as the absence of another overlap between two people or three people or four people. For sure, four people. Like that's unless you're all in psychedelics in a room and you can verify that somehow. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not sure what you're referring to as the overlap. Do you mean the overlap between two people, the overlap of their shared interior experience? Yes. Can, can I give you a, 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 just to use another analogy, a very Please. simple analogy? Take a piece of white paper. The white paper is, is for, it has nothing on it. It represents formless consciousness, consciousness prior to its activity. Now, um, imagine that, that on this uh, piece of white paper, you could imagine, sorry, imagine a white, let's imagine a white screen, that on, on this white screen, this white screen begins to, to vibrate within itself, a kind of a, 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 a fuzzy, irregular interference pattern kind of develops all, all over the, the screen. And at a certain point, um, some of these lines on the screen uh, um, coalesce and form circles. And these circles would be the equivalent of localized minds within the field of infinite consciousness. Now, this circle circumscribes a certain activity of infinite consciousness, which from the circle's point of view is experienced as inside itself. And that experience is no longer accessible to the other circles because there is a boundary around it. The other circles can't see through that boundary. So each circle has its own personal, unique experience. However, it, as, as we look out from the inside of each circle to the area of the screen that has not been delineated by a circle, everybody looks out at the same pattern. And this yeah, accounts for our experience of the, sh say, of the shared world. It's not the shared world that we experience, it's the shared consciousness that we, that, 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 that we experience. Now, circles that are configured in the same way, by which, in the analogy, I mean finite minds that are configured in the same way, will see the activity of consciousness as much the same world. When you and I look at outside, outside our circles, we see the world in pretty much the same way. We see it in, in terms of shapes and, 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 and sights and sounds and tastes and textures and smells. But imagine that uh, on, on this screen, uh, circles develop that are configured in a different way from a human mind. In other words, imagine that other kinds of finite mind uh, contract or coalesce within this infinite field of awareness. And those minds are configured differently from a human mind. Th those minds will perceive the activity of consciousness in a way that is consistent with their own limitations. So they may, what appears to them as the world may be entirely different from what appears appears to us as the world. Their experience may be completely different. Maybe they don't have the faculties of thinking and perceiving. They have the capacity of Xing and Ying, in which case the world will not appear to them in the form of sights, sounds, tastes, textures, smells and concepts. 
it will appear to them in the form of X's and Y's. Now, we have no idea, as a human mind, what that would look like. It would be completely different from our, from our world. However, what they are experiencing, the reality of what they are experiencing is identical to the reality of what we are experiencing, namely infinite consciousness. It just appears to them as a different world because of the filter of their minds through which they perceive it. So they perceive the same reality in a completely different I way. Understand. Okay, now I have a practical question. I mean, sorry, a personal question. When one dies in your model, your worldview, I imagine that's like a ripple or that's like a momentary wave coming back to the infinite consciousness. I've always struggled with this because in some ways the teachings of non-dualism is trivial to a physicist in the sense that a physicist would already agree, yes, the, Pretty much if a grand unified theory is going to be found, there's just one underlying field and all the particles are, are different excitations from different perspectives. And when I say perspectives, there's a technical meaning of that. So in some ways it's trivial. And then I also imagine that the reason why the scientist materialist types dislike the more non-dualist philosophies is not they say it's because, no, I don't think that at the fundamental reality we're all one, because they do, with quantum field theory at least, if that's, you know, you can unify in quantum field theory. Okay, it's something else. It's like that they don't like the yogas, or the, the sorry, the, the, the togas, or they don't like doing yoga, or they don't like the spiritual teaching that comes along with it. So they'll say they disagree with non-dualism, but they don't. They disagree with what they believe comes along and, and with non-dualism. Can I just insert something here? Yes. here Kurt, sure. It's a good point you make. I, I totally sympathize with them I'm, I'm in that world so i have to be very tolerant of some of the um how can i put this politely um i, I can't find the word so, some of the nonsense Woo. okay some okay. of the non that's some of the nonsense that goes along with it that has got nothing to do with the essential understanding that is being spoken of. But somebody coming to to this non-dual perspective from the outside, very often the first their first encounter will this with this perspective will be the nonsense that sometimes accompanies it. And that is enough to put any sane person off. And I totally sympathize with them. And to be fair, I see the same happening from the more I don't know what to call it, but let's say spiritual new age side. I'm not demeaning it. I hope you understand. I'm just trying to put a, a label to it. I see the same vitriol or objurgation from them to the scientist materialist types where the scientists will say, hey, you all are too much in your body, which has cognitive biases and you don't follow your rationality. You don't have what's falsifiable. But then the spiritual side will look at them and say, yeah, but you're egotistical and pig headed and quite frankly, you overvalue intelligence and you think you're you're intelligent, but you're not because intelligence isn't just abstract reasoning, but there's other forms of intelligence. So I see each side, probably you see this too, has a distinct lack of sympathy for the other side. Now, this is a gross oversimplification, obviously. I don't sense that from you. But I wondered, firstly, do you see that? Uh, I do see that. Uh, it's certainly... It's certainly not what I feel. I, I have a lot of friends who are scientists, and, and but, but even the many scientists that I'm aware of that, that, that are not my friends, I have, I have great respect for, for, for science and the scientific endeavor. I think, I think this vitriol that, that you speak of, it comes from having a, 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 a partial, a very partial, incomplete idea. Just, Basically, there, there are two ways that we can explore reality. We can either, because a human being in the, in the conventional self is obviously comes from the greater reality. Whether we have a materialistic perspective or a non-dual perspective, whatever we are as apparently separate selves, we obviously emerge out of the greater whole, whether it's a physical universe or a mental universe, what, whatever we are. It emerges out of that. So for this reason, whatever we essentially are, 
must be the same as what the universe essentially is, for the same reason that the nature of the wave is the same as the nature of, of the ocean. So there are two, possible, two possibilities for exploring reality. Either we can go outwards and we can explore the world, which is the path that the scientist and the artist takes, or we go inwards into ourself, which is the path that the, the, the mystic takes. Now, these two types of people seem to set off exploring reality in two different directions. One goes outwards, one goes inward. It's like they, they start at the top of the circle, they, they diverge immediately. But if they both travel far enough in their given direction, they will inevitably come to the same conclusion. They will meet at the bottom of the circle. They've just exploring reality through two different avenues. So I, I think that the, the real, a real scientist, and by this I, I, don't mean, I don't mean in any way to demean a scientist who is not interested in these matters. I, I don't mean to imply that. So when I say a real scientist, I mean perhaps the ultimate scientist must eventually become a mystic. And I would suggest that a mystic is a true scientist. It's the same endeavor. The endeavor of the highest endeavor in science is the same as the highest endeavor of the mystic. Namely, what? With, 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 namely, what? an investigation into the nature of reality. It's only when each party goes only halfway. At halfway, that there are two opposite parts of the circle. That's where the vitriol, the misunderstand, not necessarily the vitriol, that's where the misunderstanding comes from. When two parties are shouting at each other across this chasm, they're as far away from each other as they possibly could be. It's because both parties have, have, have not gone far enough and met in understanding. I'm thinking now. Please give me 10 seconds to of course, of course. absorb what you said. Of course. I was speaking to Ian McGilchrist and a question I didn't get to ask him, which is related to this is, he was saying that the left brain is the one that likes to routinize and make specific and delineate, whereas the right brain is the one that's the opposite, that likes to see uniqueness, not sameness, that likes to take broader views and so on. And I was wondering, hmm, so the right brain could see the whole picture. And then he was saying, and you need that because if you just investigate with the left, you're only seeing a small piece. But then what I was wondering is, I'm not a proponent of this. I know some people are, where they'll say that the universe is fractal-like in nature. And it may be. But what I'm wondering is, if the universe is fractal-like in nature, then does that not mean, Ian McGilchrist, like I'm speaking to him right now, the question I wanted to ask, that if one was to take the left to the, the left brain to the extreme, it would ultimately become the right brain, because by investigating one phenomenon completely and microscopically and even beyond, whether it's spatially, microscopic or, or temporally or whatever it may be, and beyond, you necessarily get an image of the whole. So you get an adumbration of the universe as a whole from each little point. And in that way, you can see the left and the right as being halfway on this journey but if they were to progress they would ultimately join i wanted to ask him what he thought of that but well that would be what you said reminded me of that yes well it would be very very interesting to ask him that question what i'd like to speak with him about is that throughout this conversation we've been positing these two 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 elements infinite consciousness and the finite mind and the finite mind is a, 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 a temporary localization um, of infinite consciousness within infinite consciousness. So we have these two perspectives, the perspective of infinite consciousness and the perspective of the finite mind. Would it be reasonable to suggest that the, the left and right hemispheres of the brain and the way they operate are a reflection at, at a microcosmic level of this th th these two different perspectives. 
Mm -hmm. This apparent dichotomy. So the infinite is the right brain and then the finite separate is the left. It, it, it's not a literal mapping of the two because as we suggested earlier, the, the infinite by itself cannot perceive the finite. It can only perceive the finite through the agency of a finite mind. So it wouldn't be a literal mapping, but that it, that, that, but that there is a connection between the, the perspective of infinite... Con no, infinite consciousness doesn't have a perspective. It's the finite mind that is a perspective. It doesn't have a perspective even of itself? Uh, yes, but it's not, a, it's not a point of view. So it, but, 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 but the, the, the left and right hemispheres, hemispheres would in some way reflect these two different aspects of reality, the infinite consciousness and the, and the, the localized finite mind that, that somehow the, 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 these, these two I see what you're saying. I see. Are, are somehow reflected in the structure of the brain, which would make sense if the brain is the image in mind of a localization of infinite consciousness. When one dies, this is where I was going before, and then I went on a tangent. Some, when I speak to people who are inclined to think that consciousness is one and we're all one and so on, they'll say, well, you don't die because you're consciousness. But then... To me, what I'm wondering is, what difference does that make? It would be like saying, hey, Kurt, you're actually that wall behind you. And I know you don't feel it, you don't sense it, but when you're gone, that wall is still there. Like, that wall bears no resemblance to what I already identify with. You are the wall if by you, you mean infinite consciousness. However, you, Kurt, are an apparent and temporary localization of infinite consciousness. So going back to our analogy of the screen with all the lines all, all over it, you, you are a small circle on, on this screen with your own interior life, which at least appears to be bounded by, 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 the, by, by the line that, that, that circumscribes your circle. So it's true that the screen is the essential nature of the the circle. It's the essential nature of everything outside the circle. In that sense, you are the world, you are, you are the universe. But the, also that Kurt, that the, the person Kurt, is everything that takes place inside this circle. Now, I would suggest that death is not necessarily the complete and immediate disappearance of the circle. I would suggest it, it, it was the gradual expansion and as a result, a thinning out of the circle. So you draw the circle with a, th a heavy line, just as to represent the, the, very, the very real felt sense of separation. But as the circle expands, that line, it, it gets thinner. So the separation between the contents inside the circle and the contents outside becomes uh, less and less marked. And also that the content inside the circle becomes larger and larger. Now, if that process goes on indefinitely, the circle eventually disappears completely and one's identity with the whole is realized. However, we cannot be sure that the process of death entails the complete disappearance of the circle. I think it's fair to say that it involves the expansion of the circle, which when viewed at a physical level, appears as the death of the body. But we cannot be certain that the, that the circle itself has completely dis dissolved and that it may not just simply expand. And this would account for some continuing, not only of consciousness, there's no doubt that the screen continues, but it also suggests that the continuation of some kind of limited entity, albeit no longer appearing as a body. So an expanded finite mind. Now, just I uh, just throw this in as a as a thought. Speculation. And I'm very, very cautious to, to go here because I don't want what I'm suggesting to be muddled up with with, with um the nonsense that you speak the, about the, the, the nonsense new age thinking but yes. when we look okay. when, when we look at 
some of the literature, some of the paintings of the, the, the early Christian tradition, for instance. We see paintings of, of, of beings, angels, cherubs, seraphims. That, that are, are these just the fanciful imaginations of, of painters in their studio? I would suggest not. I would suggest that these were attempts to represent, albeit within the limitations of our waking state minds, mm -hmm. to, to represent some reality to, of the finite mind, the finite soul, that is larger than what we currently know ourselves to be, but is still bounded within the limits of some kind of finite mind. In other words, these could be depictions, albeit represented in a way that is consistent with the limitations of our own mind in the waking state, of, of a region of the mind that continues, a region of the finite mind, not just a consciousness, a region of the finite mind that continues in an expanded form after the death of the physical body. How do you think they came to that conclusion to represent it as an angel? Was it by dreaming and then they through introspection and intuition and they then had to represent those intuitions and recognitions in a form that was consistent with the language of the waking state. They had to represent oh, those yeah. those those beings and so they represented it in a way that was the way they represent their own being, in other words, as a physical body, but they also gave them wings and halos to somehow depict in a simplistic way that, that, that these, these beings were somehow larger than the very finite physical bodies that we seem to be in the waking state. The nature of free will. So do you believe free will exists? Okay, I'm just going to list them out. I also wanted to talk about, this is something I've been thinking about, which is Science 2.0. The reason I say that is that science 300 years ago isn't the same science as it is now. It was developed over the course of a couple hundred years. And then to me, what I'm wondering is, hmm, do we think science is in its final form? Okay, what would science evolve to? Does it mean to take seriously meditation and introspection and use experiential data? Well, how would that work? What is the criteria that holds one science's more sciencey than another and i gave it a name instead of science 2.0 i call it gnaw science for gnosis because they both mean knowledge or which i can't pronounce abjina science which is the buddhist word for knowledge Ab abjina i believe i could be mispronouncing it okay so there's that i like your idea can, can i respond to that last idea yeah. of science, <laughs> science 2.0 2 When we investigate, let's go, go back to this um, suggestion that I said scientists and artists uh, explore reality by going outwards, mystics explore re reality by going inwards. When we explore the external world, or the external reality, the only means we have of doing so is through perception, and then we conceptualize our perceptions. So in other words, our only knowledge of the un our only experience of the universe is perception, sights, sounds, tastes, textures, and smells. So we start exploring these, and we start thinking that that uh, the universe is made out of molecules. Then we realize it's made out of atoms. Then we realize it's made out of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And we go down and down and down, getting finer and finer. And, and at some stage, and I think this is where science is now. At some stage, there there is this recognition that the, f the finite mind filters everything that it knows or perceives through its own limitations. And the finite mind cannot, cannot perceive reality in the, ab in the absence of those limitations. Thought and perception are the tools the finite mind has to know anything. And those tools are limited. The faculties of thought and perception. Hi there. Hi. The faculties of thought and perception impose their own limits on the reality they are exploring. Just as one who wears orange tinted glasses 
will always see orange snow. It's not possible to see white snow through orange tinted glasses. For the same reason, it's not possible to know the nature of reality when we explore reality with the finite mind, which is what science currently does. Now, if that was all there was to it, then we would have to conclude that we can never know the nature of reality, because all we can know are, 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 are the, the limitations of our own mind. Now, that would be true, but for one fact. The fact that we, as apparently separate selves or human beings, emanate from reality. What do you mean by that? You mean that we're a part of reality and that we came from this under... The, the universe gives birth to our physical body. I see. Okay. So we, we emerge out of the universe. Whatever the universe is made of, we as apparent individuals emerge out of it. So what, what we're saying is if we as individuals investigate the nature of the universe, our investigation is by definition limited by the, the faculties of thought and perception. Are we destined, therefore, only ever to know the universe through the the limited faculties of thought and perception in other words can we never really know reality or do we have access to any aspect of reality that is not mediated through thought and perception everything we know of the world the reality of the world or the universe we know through the faculties of thinking and perceiving if that were the if that was all there was to our knowledge of reality then our knowledge of reality would always be limited by the limitations of the faculties through which we explore it, namely thought and perception. So we must ask the question, is there any element of reality that we have direct, unmediated access to? When I say unmediated, I mean not mediated through thought and perception. And the answer is yes, there is one element of reality whose knowledge we have direct access of without the mediation of thought and perception, and that is our knowledge of ourself. And therefore, going back to your question about science 2.0, I think eventually a, a scientist must realise that in order to know the nature of reality, they must know the nature of the mind through which that reality is perceived. In other words, their exploration of the nature of the world must eventually turn round and become the exploration of the nature of their own minds. And there is one aspect of our knowledge of ourself that is not mediated through the faculties of thought and perception, and that is our awareness of being aware. Is that not a perception? No, no, it, no. It, I don't it, know. It's I'm direct. Just it, it, it's it, 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 uh, our knowledge of ourself, our awareness of our own being, is direct knowledge. It is not mediated through the faculties of thought and perception. It is the only experience there is that is not mediated through the finite mind, and therefore it is as such that the the exploration into the nature of consciousness is the very highest science. It is the science, I think it, it's what science will, event, that, that physics will not, physics as it is currently known, and even mathematics as it is currently known, will not turn out to be the highest sciences. I think the highest science is an investigation into the nature of consciousness. And I think sooner or later, uh, I think you'll hear physicists some are already saying this, but I think more and more people will come to this recognition that the ultimate science, the science upon which all other sciences must rest, is the investigation into the nature of consciousness. Because that is the only, uh, our knowledge of our own being, our awareness of being, is the only experience there is that is not subject to the limitations of the finite mind. Yes. Let me put that in the analogy about John Smith and please, King Lear. Please. I know you have a, you don't like it particularly, but everything please. John Smith knows about King's Lear, King Lear's world, his daughters, the Kingdom of England, the war with France, 
everything he knows about King Lear's world is mediated through the character of King Lear. John Smith cannot remain at home in his apartment and have a relationship with Cordelia. Cordelia doesn't exist in his world. In order to have a relationship with Cordelia, he must seem to become King Lear. It is through the agency or faculties of King Lear that John Smith is able to have a relationship with his daughters, the, the kingdom, etc. There is one element of his experience that is not mediated through the faculties of King Lear, and that is his knowledge of himself. In order to know Cordelia, the Kingdom of England, and the war with France, he must seem to become King Lear. But in order to know himself, he knows himself directly. His knowledge of himself as John Smith is not mediated through the character King Lear. Now, that, that, that is a very clear, close analogy. Our knowledge of ourself as consciousness is not mediated through the faculties of the finite mind. Everything we know of the universe, objectively, is mediated through the finite mind and appears in a conformance with, in, 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 in conformity with the limitations of that mind. But our knowledge of ourself is a unique knowledge. It is absolute knowledge. It is the only knowledge there is that is not relative to the limitations of the finite mind through which it is known. It's why it's referred to as the absolute in, in, the, in the religious traditions. And sooner or later, I think science will recognize this and the, 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 the study of the nature of consciousness. Now, when I say the study of the nature of consciousness, I don't mean that the finite mind can study consciousness. All, all the courses you, you see now advertised, consciousness studies, th th these these courses have nothing to do with the studies of consciousness. They're studies of brain activity. And you know, no, The study of the nature of consciousness is, is traditionally it's called prayer. Uh, or in the East it was called meditation. It is, is, it is the experience of being aware of being aware. From the mind's point of view, it is silence. It's a, in, from the mind's point of view, silence is, is the highest science. It gives us, it is through the silence of the finite mind that we have direct access to reality. So sooner or later, scientists will understand that what the mystics were doing, they're in meditation and prayer was the ultimate science, the ultimate investigation into the nature of reality. And for this reason, I think sooner or later, the, the, ultim the, the most advanced scientists will become mystics, as indeed true mystics are scientists. Also, so you know, whenever I'm pausing, I tend to pause in my speech. It's actually for a similar reason, but more about, I want to make sure that what I'm saying is a true statement. I don't want to rehash what I've said before, because then I feel like I'm being like a politician where I have a set amount of phrase, sorry, set phrases. I want to make sure that it feels right. And that I'm actually saying what I'm intending to say. So if I pause, please forgive me also, but it's just that I'm thinking. I also do think that whatever science will become, which then one has to wonder, well, what is it? Why are you calling it science if it's no longer like science? So there's some other criteria. Maybe that criteria has to do with explaining the world. You mentioned investigating nature. So that's another one. Hmm. I do imagine it would take the form of more subjective experience, but then how? How do we do that objectively in a way that we can falsify and so on? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, anyway, I like what you said about that. If you're watching this channel because you're interested in theoretical physics, consciousness, and the ostensible connection between the two, what's required to follow some of these arguments is facility with mathematics as well as discernment of the underlying physical laws. And you may think that this is beyond you, but that's false. Brilliant provides pellucid explanations of abstruse phenomena such as quantum computing, general relativity, and even group theory. When you hear that the standard model is based on U1 cross SU2 cross SU3, that's group theory, for example. Now, this isn't just for neophytes either. For example, 
I have a degree in math and physics and I still found some of the intuitions given in these lessons to vastly aid my penetration into these subjects. For example, electricity and magnetism. Sign up today at brilliant.org slash toe, that is T-O-E, for free. You'll also get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Try four of the lessons at least. Don't stop before four. And I think you'll be greatly surprised at the ease at which you comprehend subjects you previously had trouble grokking. Links are in the description. Okay, and I also wanted to quickly apologize. I'm editing the previous video and I noticed I interrupted you quite a few times. That's no partially a function of the delay. There's about a five second or three second delay. So I think you're finished and then I speak, but you're not. And then, okay. so right. I'm sorry no, about that. I feel- Don't worry at all. I'm sure okay. I interrupted you as well. Um, yeah, but that's okay. You're totally fine to interrupt. I prefer. Okay. We'll get straight to this. Okay. This question comes from Huber Galula. Rupert, after all these years of self-realization, do you still get overwhelmed with emotion sometimes? Do you still get attached to objects, relationships, or key people? The answer is uh, no, I don't get overwhelmed by emotions. Uh, am I attached to, to people? Uh, yes, there is a, a sort of natural attachment. I couldn't say that I was um, not that, that I was um, equally unattached to, to my son as I am to a, a stranger that I pass in, in the street or see on, on a news program. There is a, a kind of but but I consider this to be a just a normal functional attachment. It, it just a, a a natural attachment that that um, exists between a parent, say, and and a child, and it's appropriate that there is uh, such an attachment. If a mother were not more attached to her child than uh, any other child, then she would be not would not be motivated to to look after it and take care of it. So um, e e yes, I, I, I am more attached, for instance, to, to, to my son than I am to a stranger. But this does not mean that I, does not mean that I love my son more than anyone else. And perhaps I should just be clear about what I mean by the word love in this context. L love, I would suggest is not really a feeling that one person or individual has towards another. It is the felt recognition of our shared being. So I feel that I share my being with everyone, indeed with everything, but I express that in very different ways. I express my felt sense of uh, my shared being with my son in a very different way than I do with um, the, the, the postman or a stranger or somebody I might uh, meet j j just once. So uh, again, there, there can be, one can love everybody, indeed we should love everybody because we should recognize that we share our being with everyone. But this does not mean that we don't have uh, unique and special relationships with some people that we don't have with others, nor does it mean that we necessarily like everybody. We're not called to like everybody, but we are called to love everybody. And this understanding doesn't imply that we like everyone, but it does imply that we love everyone. So again, just to be clear about the, what I mean there, what, what, what we like in another person is uh, that their character, their conditioning, the way they think, the way they feel, their body, uh, uh, their conditioning. What we love has nothing to do with the character of the person. The love is entirely the relationship between one being and another. In fact, the, the, the absence of relationship, the, 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 the recognition that we share our being, it doesn't have anything to do with the, the individual characteristics of that person. That de determines whether we like them or not. So again, I, I would say I love everybody equally, but that doesn't mean that I like everybody equally. You mentioned that 
there was a functional difference between the love or the attachment that you have for your son or your wife compared to other types of attachments. And then you gave the example of a mother for her child. What's the difference between a functional attachment and a dysfunctional attachment? Is it just evolution? This one is great for our species or is it something else? A dysfunctional attachment would be the sense that one requires the other emotionally. In other words, that one's emotional well-being depends upon them. That would be a, a psychological attachment. Now, what I mean by psychological attachment is an attachment that stems from the belief and feeling that we are a temporary, finite, separate self. That temporary, finite, separate self, I would suggest, is an illusion. However, if we don't realize it, that it is an illusion, if we feel, if we believe and feel that we are a temporary, finite self, then in order to substantiate that belief and feeling, we will form attachments. That's one of the way the ego or apparently separate self validates and substantiates itself, namely by by forming attachments. And that would be a dysfunctional attachment, namely an, an attachment that um, enhances the sense of the ego, which is the dysfunctional element of the mind. Whereas a functional attachment would not be an attachment that comes from the sense of separation or the sense of being a separate self or ego. It is it is hardwired into the relationship, such as the relationship between a mother and a, a child or indeed a father and a child. The next question comes from in Anna Whimsy. Rupert, is there any emotion that isn't valid? So you're welcome to interpret valid any way you like, but please also let the audience know what you mean by the word valid. Okay, so let's let me let me explain the, the 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 distinction that I make between what are commonly grouped together as emotions. Sometimes we hear uh, phrases such as positive and negative emotions. Positive emotions would be emotions such as uh, joy, peace, love, etc. Negative emotions would be anxiety, fear, jealousy, um, and so on. So I think that uh, this classification of these two groups of emotion into positive and negative is misleading. What this classific classification suggests is that they are uh, comparable emotions, but opposite to one another. And I think this is a misunderstanding. What I refer to as emotions are in, in using this uh, categorization would be negative emotions, afflictive emotions, jealousy, um, anxiety, uh, a sense of being unloved or unlovable, or, um, these kinds of emotions. Whereas what are sometimes referred to as positive emotions, emotions, peace, joy, love, are not really, or at least the way I use the words, not really emotions as such. They are the very nature of our being. So let me give you an, a, a visual analogy to try and make this clear. If we were to, um, if you were to live in England at the moment, and you were to look up at the sky, you would see it's uh, roughly half clouds and half blue sky. Now, one, the, the, the equivalent, in this analogy, the equivalent of dividing emotions into positive and negative would be the equivalent of dividing the sky into gray clouds and blue clouds. And one might at first sight think that the cloud, the sky does consist of gray clouds and blue clouds. After all, we look up, it's half gray half blue. That's how it first appears. However, when we investigate more clearly, we realize it's not like that. The clouds are temporary appearances in the homogeneous, unlimited expanse of blue sky. So what we refer to sometimes as positive emotions, peace, love, joy, happiness, these are 
the the blue sky of awareness the ever-present background of awareness that gets obscured by our afflictive emotions just as the blue sky is temporarily obscured by the gray clouds so that the, the clouds and the sky they they are um on a different level so likewise i would say um, emotions um, are on a different level that the positive emotions so-called positive emotions and, and negative emotions and re re read the question kurt again oh that's fine now, are, are there any emotions it? Are there any emotions, uh, there any emotions that, aren't that are valid? not valid? Yes. So I don't really div divide emotions into whether they are valid or not. It, it's, it's more on who uh, the question to ask is on whose behalf does the emotion arise? I would suggest that all afflictive emotions, these are the gray clouds, all afflictive emotions arise on behalf of the apparently temporary, finite, separate self or ego that we seem to be. And all positive, so-called positive emotions uh, arise in the absence of the sense of separation. In fact, when the sense of separation or the sense of being an ego or separate self collapses, the background of awareness, our true nature, shines by itself just as when the clouds disperse, the blue sky shines by itself. That shining of our true nature is experienced as a human being as peace, love, and happiness. So all emotions are valid simply by virtue of the fact that they exist. So the real question is on whose behalf, if we consider peace, love, and joy to be emotions along with our afflictive emotions, the question is, on whose behalf do our emotions arise? All afflictive emotion arises on behalf of the apparently temporary finite separate self or ego that we seem to be. And all so-called positive emotions, peace, love, joy, happiness, are the shining of our true nature. Is the claim that all of what we traditionally classify as positive emotion is the blue sky? The reason I'm asking is because there are a litany of positive emotions like excitement or the rush of competitiveness i'm not sure then competitiveness to me sounds like an ego predicated feeling but yet it's a positive one if you win or if you're excited about the competition so are there examples of what we would traditionally would classify as positive affect that is a gray cloud yes i, I think there's a i think there's a gray area here um, take competition competition could uh, arise from either of these two camps the sense of separation or from our true nature let me give you um we try to give you an example T take a, a take competition one who feels competitive could want to win in order to enhance their fragile sense of identity and in that sense the competitiveness would arise on behalf of the the separate self or ego however one could all one's so-called or what would appear from the outside to be competitiveness could also arise from within one in response to one's desire for excellence And in this case, one's desire for, for excellence would not be an expression of the separate self or ego. It would be an attempt, albeit through the limited means of one's uh, sport or whatever it was one was competing in. It would be an attempt to, to somehow manifest in one's life the qualities that one intuited to be uh, inherent in one's true nature so you you take to take a you take take a take a tennis for instance a, a sport that i enjoy playing and, and watching you, the people and not just the people at the top of them their game but at, at all levels of the game one can play competitively for for, for the joy of playing 
and for the joy of placing one's body in a circumstance where it is required to excel, exceed its normal limits, to somehow to, to, to put one's body in a position where it has to express something that is beyond the limits of the separate self on whose behalf it usually acts. So one's competitive streak there would come from a deep impulse inside oneself to somehow transcend oneself, in this case, through one's chosen sport or, or activity. So it could be a gray area. The uh, com competitiveness could be an expression of the ego or the separate self. It could be a desire to bring the qualities that are inherent in our true nature into manifestation. Here's one area that I'm egoically competitive with you. You have great <laughs> skin. Your skin is wonderful, man. Well, it's it's uh, summertime. I spend a fair amount of time uh, playing tennis, uh, walking in nature and in the garden. So at this time of year, um, I've I, I've got a nice suntan. <laughs> Not because I've it's been smooth as like well. Caribbean beach. It's just it's just the the lovely English weather and the and the time of year. <laughs> the next question comes from Rebecca Briggs. What importance has personal ego and shadow work in the non-dual recognition tradition? So let's take shadow work. I'm sure you've heard that Jungian concept. What's the relationship between that and your theories or beliefs, or non-dualism in general? In the, in the non-dual, in the history of, of non-duality, there are two basic approaches, although we find all sorts of variations of these approaches in the religious and spiritual traditions. And the, these two approaches could be uh, characterized in this way, that the direct path and the progressive path. Now, the progressive path is, is the traditional approach, and it involves taking a, a, the ego or the separate self as one finds it and putting it through a series of practices whereby it is progressively purified and refined of its egoic tendencies until it is considered sufficiently mature to be uh, given the highest teachings or the highest practices uh, whereby uh, the uh, mind subsides into the heart of awareness. Now, these progressive practices could last anything from two years to, to, to 20 years. And it's a gradual progressive path that the apparently separate self or ego undertakes um, as a prelude to receiving the, the, the highest instruction. Now, the direct path teachings take a completely different approach. Uh, the, the idea behind the direct path approach, and, and this, by the way, is the approach I take, uh, in, in most cases, not always, but in most cases, the idea behind the direct path approach is that everybody, without exception, is aware. All 7.8 billion or so of us are aware. In other words, awareness. Quick question about that. Okay, you mentioned people. Are animals also aware? Yes. Uh, uh, can we come? We can, sure. Can sure, we sure. come? I, I say yes hesitantly. I'll, I'll explain later why I'm hesitating. Um, let, let's park that question. We'll, we'll come. Got it. Come back to it. So. Um, Yes, everyone is, is uh, considered to be aware simply by virtue of the fact that we are all aware of our experience. Therefore, awareness is present in everyone. In fact, everyone's essential nature is awareness, not just those few, relatively few of us that are interested in, in these matters, but all 7.8 billion of us are aware. And therefore, 
all 7.8 billion of us have the potential capacity to go directly to the experience of being aware, irrespective of the content of their minds, uh, their feelings or their bodies. And so in this approach, one's so-called um, maturity, spiritual maturity or preparedness uh, have got nothing to do with it. One could have been um, considering these matters for 30 years, somebody else could just come in off the street never having thought about them before and could be taken directly to their true nature by asking a question such as, uh, what is it that knows or is aware of your experience? And if the mind con considers this question, it turns its attention away from what it is aware of, and it traces its way back to its essence or source, the fact of being aware. In this case, what we are aware of, however dysfunctional our minds or our bodies may be, is irrelevant. We are still aware of that dysfunction. And as such, awareness shines equally brightly in the darkest mind, as it does in the most luminous or intelligent mind so um, these are the these are the two approaches you can read the the question please again Kurt. sure no problem she wanted to know what role does shadow work have yes in okay. so shadow work now in the progressive uh, path the shadow work uh, the exploring of the, the the deeper tendencies of the of the mind would happen on the in those first progressive practices during the the, the 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 years of our spiritual practice where we are gradually exploring refining maturing the mind before it is considered sufficiently mature to uh, sink into its source so in this approach the, the the shadow work the exploration of the deeper regions of the mind would take place before this um, practice of self-inquiry or, or, or the recognition of our true nature. In the direct path, no shadow work is considered necessary because however dark or complex or, or dysfunctional one's mind may be, one is aware of it. And all that is necessary is to go to the fact of being aware. However, in this case, the direct uh, approach, one may recognize one's true nature However, having recognized one's true nature, one will find all the old patterns of thinking and feeling still in place. The recognition of our true nature doesn't, doesn't just wipe the slate of our conditioning clean. And one will have to deal with those issues, the, 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 the deeper habits and tendencies and patterns of thinking and feeling sooner or later. So in the direct approach, uh, the the so-called shadow work, the, the so-called realignment of the habits of thinking and feeling with our um, uh, enlightened understanding tends to take place after this recognition, whereas in the progressive path, path it takes place before. Now, in practice, it takes place a, a little bit before and it continues to take place afterwards. We also mentioned, or you were talking about how humans can become aware, and I asked if animals were naturally yeah. aware of their yeah. own awareness. Okay, th this is, um, well, so the first question you asked me, I think, was, were animals aware? Let uh, me not... explain why I want to know, because that may help contextualize the question. I'm curious if this state of being aware of one's awareness or being aware of one's connectedness to all, that this is all one vellum, like I say, or you say, sorry, or non-dualism says, sorry. Is that a natural tendency? And if it is so natural, why does it arise everywhere, pretty much globally, that we're separate? Okay. Like, how does that come about? Why, why is the mind, why is the infinite consciousness frustrating itself? Is it not frustrating itself right. with animals? Okay, but but that that, that that's a that, that's another that's another question. That, okay, let's come to that in a minute. Kurt. Okay, but let, let's um, deal with the issue as to whether animals are aware, and then the the second question: whether animals are aware of being aware. So, if we start 
if we respond to this question, are animals aware from the conventional point of view, namely that we as human beings are aware, then it is, it is reasonable to say, yes, animals are aware. We know that if we tread on our dog or, or cat's tail, the cat, uh, the, the, the dog or the cat screeches in pain. And it's safe for us to conclude that they screech with pain because they feel the pain, they are aware of it. So we can, for the same reason that we screech with pain if somebody treads on our toe. So we, we conclude from this that the animal is aware. The reason we say the animal is aware is because we feel that we as a human being are aware. Now, on the surface of it, this is, this all makes sense. And then as we go, we go uh, from animals and dogs and cats are aware, chickens and fishes, fishes are aware. And we go down and down and down and down until we get to a line where we think, OK, now past this line, nothing is aware. But, possibly plants, trees, there's some discussion about that. Stones are not aware, uh, um, pavements, cars, computers are not aware, etc. Et so there is this line, human beings are aware, dogs and cats, chickens and fish, and then suddenly some, from, from there on, the, the, the object or entity is, is not aware. This is the conventional point of view, and it's based on a presumption, an uninspected presumption that we all take so for granted that um, we don't really question it, uh, namely that we as human beings are aware or that we have awareness. In other words, that awareness is an attribute of us as a human being. And this, um, this definition has um, found its way into philosophy of mind circles. It's been enshrined in philosophy of mind circles by uh, an American philosopher, I think, Thomas Nagel, I think, in the uh, 70s, I believe, who, who defined, uh, who, who, who enshrined this understanding in a definition of uh, consciousness that is, con that is really used in many philosophy of mind circles as a sort of standard definition of consciousness. And, his definition, I, I'm not quoting verbatim, but, it, but I'm paraphrasing it, it goes something like this. An, an entity can be considered to be aware or to be conscious or to have conscious experiences or states if and only if there is something it is like to be that entity, if there is something it is like for that entity. And the famous example, if there is something it is like to be a bat, then we can conclude that bats are conscious or have consciousness. And if there is no experience that corresponds to the statement, I am a table, then we can conclude that tables are not conscious because no table has the experience of being itself. So this is used as a standard definition of consciousness in philosophy of mind circles, and it is based on an assumption which I would suggest is a mistake. The assumption is I, as a human being, know myself as a human being. And that is my proof of being conscious because I have the experience of being myself as a human being. In other words, I, a human being, am aware of myself. That's the fundamental mistake. A human being is not conscious. A dog or a cat is not conscious. A chicken or a fish is not conscious. A bat is not conscious. Only consciousness is conscious. Only awareness is aware. Therefore, the only entity, if we can call it an entity, that has the experience of being itself is consciousness. There is only something it is like to be consciousness. Would you disagree with Descartes, I think, therefore I am, because a thought is fleeting and you would say you shouldn't take that as evidence that you well, are? I, th I think De Descartes gets a, um, a bad rap in non-dual circles because uh, pe people tend to think that he meant literally I have thoughts, therefore I am conscious. That is not what he meant. 
I think that what he meant is I, I, I have, I, I have conscious experience. Therefore, I am conscious. He didn't literally mean because I have thoughts. Therefore, I must be conscious. I think we can credit Descartes with more intelligence than that. He was obviously a highly intelligent man, and it's quite obvious that that there is a, a gap between two thoughts. If there were no gap between two thoughts, they would not be two thoughts. They would be one right. thought. There are gaps between the words in any one thought. If there were no gap, each thought would consist of one word. So in these gaps between thoughts, we are not thinking, but we are obviously still conscious. So, and, and, and obviously Descartes understood this. So um, I think we must credit, I think it's, it, it, it's not fair to, to Descartes to, to suggest that he literally thought, but it is only because we have thoughts that we are conscious because dogs and cats would not be conscious. They would not be able to feel pain when you trod on their tail if, if the, the, the definition of consciousness was, was an entity that has thoughts. So going back to, to this, um, what I consider to be a mistake, the, 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 the fundamental assumption is I as a human being that am conscious or have consciousness. And this has given rise to so much misunderstanding about consciousness in the, in the philosophy of mind um, circles. It, it, it is only awareness is aware, only consciousness is conscious, and therefore only consciousness has the experience of being myself. Only consciousness has the knowledge of its own being. And our, each of us as human beings, we have the experience of being. But when I say we have the experience of being, it is not we as a human being. It is not we a collection of thoughts, images, feelings, sensations, and perceptions that has the experience of being. It is, it is consciousness in us. No, it's actually not in us, but it, it is the conscious element of our experience that has the experience of being itself. The mistake we make as human beings is add a quality to the pure experience of being aware of our being. When we when we that the simple awareness of being is expressed by the in the phrase simply i am everybody has the experience i am that phrase refers to our essential irreducible self or being pure consciousness it is only when we allow the i am to be qualified by experience that we become i am this or i am that and that is that that is the separate self or the ego, an, an apparent qualification of our essential irreducible self or being, namely pure consciousness. I want to thank you so much for speaking with me. And again, I apologize for any ineptitude on my part as a podcaster for interrupting you so often. Uh, please, Kurt, there's no need for, for, for apology. I enjoy... I enjoyed our conversation a couple of days ago very much indeed, and and, and the conversation flows very easily. As as I said, then you 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 have a you have a very nice way of, of asking very very pertinent um, questions, and the conversation flows very very easily. With so please no no no, no and feel free to interrupt me as well. As, um, so, um, okay, thank you, thank you, sir. This one comes from DIY. Actually, I have this one. It sounds like non-dualism is what's echoed in the Vedic texts. And what I'm wondering is, why is it that the East, and which means that it's right in some way, it sounds like the East got it right earlier, in fact, at all, compared to the West, which is extremely dualistic, at least seemingly so with the Old Testament and the New Testament, and even Islamic texts. How do we account for this? How come one set of people we're so much closer to the truth. I don't think, I don't think one set of people were closer to the truth. Uh, uh, awareness is the nature of the essential nature of everybody, the Christians, the Hindus, the Muslims, the atheists, the, 
the saints, the sinners, the, uh, uh, the, the aboriginals, the, 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 uh, everyone. It's true that in the um, in India, this uh, tradition of investigation, this science of the mind, uh, goes back uh, at least three thousand years. In, in in fact, longer. But the same the same was true in the in the West. If you, if you read um, Parmenides, considered to be the, uh, the the founding father of Western philosophy who predates Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. Uh, um, and then if uh, fast forward uh, um, a few centuries, you read Plotinus, uh, uh, Meister Eckhart, Jakob Burma, um, w w William Blake, I mean, all, all through uh, um, uh, the history of Western thought, this understand, I'm just mentioning a few, there are so many more, you, you find this understanding. Um, but I think due to the, the advent of Christianity, uh, in the West, we were far less tolerant, uh, of this, um, investigation into the nature of the mind, that the spiritual tradition was appropriated by the state. And a lot of, um, of this kind of investigation was suppressed. So it was, it's not that people in the West didn't have this recognition. It was that this kind of investigation was not able to flourish as freely in the West as it was in, in the East. And it went therefore uh, underground in, in, in the West. But, it, but it's, it's, not, it's not an understanding that, that belongs to the East or comes from the East. It's universal. It's the perennial philosophy. It's the philosophy that, that is the, that is true. That, because truth, if, if there is something called the absolute truth, then it must be absolutely true for all people at all times, under all circumstances. It can have nothing to do with East, West, uh, beliefs, traditions, religions, uh, um, these, most of these, although they, most of these traditions, although they originated from an insight into the nature of reality, they were later um, misunderstood and appropriated by, um, usually by the, by the state. And the original understanding was then either um, distorted and perverted or simply lost. Um, but this, you, you find this understanding at, really at the heart of all the great religious and spiritual traditions. And in fact, the extent to which one understands one's true nature um, is a measure of the extent to which one can read the scriptures of the world and find in very different formulations the same understanding. I've, I've gone back um, sometimes to the... The, uh, I was brought up a Christian and, and uh, I was in boarding school for years. We used to sing all the hymns and psalms. I, I know many of them off by heart simply because we, simply because we, we sang them so often. When I, when I go back to them now, I'm so, I'm so touched by them. The, 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 the language of the psalms, once you can, uh, once you can interpret them in a non-dual way, or even though they may be conceived in dualistic terms, this was just a poetic device. But if you really um, interpret them from a non-dual perspective, that they are exquisitely beautiful. And you find this in all, if, if you reread, I won't say all, but a lot of the great religious and spiritual texts, they are all suffused with this understanding and of course express it in very different ways according to the, the time and the place in which they were formulated. Are you able to give an example of a non-dualist interpretation of something from Christianity? For example, Jesus' death or one of his miracles? I could, um, 
I could say something about the the、um, parable of the prodigal son. Please do. Which can be interpreted in a kind of、um, moralistic way about a a, a young man ju- ju- just、um, taking advantage of his father's inheritance and and. Uh, just le-、uh, leaving home and leading a, a, a completely self-indulgent, decadent existence, and becoming destitute, and then going back home to. But this is, of course, not the the meaning of the parable at all. I would suggest that the 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 father in this、uh, parable represents infinite consciousness, and the son. Represents the localization of infinite consciousness, namely each of our finite minds. So, just as the fun,、uh, just as the sun、uh, proceeds from the father as an emanation of the father, a, a kind of a smaller version of the father, so likewise each of our finite minds emanates f- from infinite consciousness within infinite consciousness as a microcosm of infinite consciousness, and that that that. The finite mind, once it has、um, contracted out of infinite consciousness into a separate self, it、uh, it seems to become something temporary and finite. And being temporary and finite, it feels that it is incomplete, that it lacks something. And the entire life of the separate self or ego is. Uh, characterized by its desire to complete itself or fulfill itself, and to that end, all separate selves go out into the world on a great journey in search of objects, substances, activities, relationships,、uh, for the sole purpose of uh, 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 bringing to an end the sense of lack that it feels in its heart. In fact, the separate self doesn't really want the object, the substance, the relationship, or so on. It only wants such an object in order that it will bring its sense of lack to an end, and, and, and as such, bring it to peace or happiness. But the separate self doesn't realize this. It believes that what it really seeks is the object, the substance, the activity, the relationship, and this is. This is expressed in the parable as the prodigal son going out into the world, having every kind of experience in search of fulfilment, but nothing fulfills it. Fulfills it, and eventually it gets to the end of the possibilities of exploring happiness in objective experience,、um, symbolized in 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 the、uh, parable by the the eating of the the, the pigs, the the swines. Food. It, it, it's desperate. It, it's tried everything. Its search for happiness in objective experience has come to an end. There's no. There's nothing else in objective experience that it can,、um, in which it can search for happiness. And as a result, there is this spontaneous turning around. That this prodigal son turns around to face the father. This is the turning around of the mind. The mind that is normally directed towards the objective content of experience turns round and be- faces its source, the presence of awareness from which it originally emanate, emanated. And this is the this is the、uh, symbolised as the in the Christian tradition. It is prayer. In in the East, it's called meditation, where the mind turns its attention away from its objective content. And begins to trace its way back to its source, and that's really the essence of prayer or meditation—the sinking of the mind into the heart or the source of awareness, which is symbolised in this in this、um, parable by the return of the son to the father. Now, that would be a, an example of a non-dual interpretation of a Christian、uh, parable. I think you should do some lectures. Much like Jordan Peterson has these biblical lectures, but yours taking a non-dualist perspective that sounds extremely interesting, insightful as well.、Uh, okay, there's a couple notes I, I'm thinking of. For what, I'll just say them. When it comes to prayer, you mentioned prayer in prayer to the West is what meditation is to the East. However, the way that I understand prayer in the West is that 
one is thinking of God as an object in a sense, and I'm praying to God. It's not the union with one and God is not the same as I'm becoming God. It's more like I'm going to allow God's will to shine through me. I still see a dichotomy. So I don't see prayer as being the same in the West. Sorry, I don't see the analogy as being exact between prayer in the West and meditation in the East. So please give me your non-dualist interpretation, just like okay. you did for that parable. Okay. I, I hope I used the phrase, the essence of prayer, when I referred to prayer, because you're right, most of what goes under the name of prayer in the West is not what is considered to be meditation in the East, although there are also many types of meditation in the East, of course. But I would suggest that the essence of prayer or the highest form of prayer does equate to what is considered the highest form of meditation in the East, which is sometimes called self-inquiry or self-abidance, this sinking of the mind into the heart of awareness. So let me try and um, let me try and I I explain this. And I think I'll I'll use the analogy of the dream. To, 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 because it's, I, I hope it will help. During the conversation we had a couple of um, days ago, Kurt, I, I mentioned uh, the analogy of, of how the dreamer's mind imagines the dreamed world within itself and simultaneously localizes itself as the separate subject of experience, the dreamed character, from whose point of view it, it sees its own mind the activity of its own mind as the dreamed world. Now, the separate subject of experience, the dreamed character, of course, doesn't know this. It doesn't know that both itself and the, the world, which it considers to be a real world, are, are the activity of a dreamer's mind, which doesn't appear anywhere in the time and space that seem to be real from its point of view. So from the point of view of the dreamed character, the dream character considers itself to be, be a body inside which exists a mind. And it considers that the outside world is separate from itself and made out of something other than itself, namely matter. Now, this, the dream character, the apparently separate subject of experience, looks at this world and, of course, marvels at it. And it, almost all... Uh, dreamed characters, separate selves or finite minds, look look at the, the world and wonder where where did it come from? The, the world obviously gave birth to me, to my body, but the world must have appeared. It must have arisen out of something. And just as the world out of which my body emerged is greater than and outside of my body, so that which gave birth to the world must be even greater than and outside of the world. So the, the dream character imagines that there is something beyond the world, beyond the universe, in fact, that is even greater than the universe and has such extraordinary miraculous powers that it can give birth to the universe. Now, the name it gives to that supernatural being is God. And God is, in this model, conceived as being at an infinite distance from the separate self and has to be approached through prayer, supplication, denial of self. And Now, that's the... It's a rather crude an, an analogy, but that, that's the, the basic model of dualistic prayer. The individual self at an infinite distance from a created God. And this distance, what one can never, one could never really be, be united with this God. One would always, there would always be a distance, a sense of otherness. Now, when we wake up in the morning, when the dreamer wakes up, they realize, of course, that the, the creator 
of the world was not some supernatural being at an infinite distance from itself. Its own mind didn't create a world outside of itself. The dreamed world was the very activity of its own mind. In other words, what the dreamed character believed to be a, a creator god outside the dreamed world actually turned out to be the very activity of the dreamer's mind, which was the essence of the dreamed character. So from this point of view, in order to have go back to the, the dream now, in order for the dreamer to access God, that, that is the reality of its universe, it has to go deep within itself. Going out into the world won't get it, won't bring it any knowledge of that which creates the dreamed world. If it wants to find that which creates the dreamed world, namely the dreamer's mind, it must go deep into its own, into itself. It must investigate what is my essential self, what, what is the nature of the knowing with which I know my experience. It's not my thoughts, not my feelings, not my sensations, not my perceptions. And in, in, in that way, the, the dreamed character is tracing its way back to its essential irreducible self, which is, of course, the dreamer's mind. So it turns out that the God that, it, that the dreamed char character previously conceived at an infinite distance from itself now turns out to be its very own being. In fact, there is no being, there is no separate self, to, either to know God or not to know God. The separate self is an, a temporary and apparent limitation of God, that is, of the dreamer's mind. There's no question from this point of view of the, the separate self having a relationship with God. There is no separate self there, either to have a relationship or not to have a relationship with God, God or infinite being or infinite consciousness is, is, the, is, is the only reality there is. And the, the separate self is an apparent limitation of that reality. So in that sense, to pray to God would mean to go deeply into one's own being. Well, that's self-inquiry. That's the essence of meditation in the East. So in that sense, what the, the essence of meditation in the East and the essence of prayer are exactly the same activity. You also mentioned that when we're this finite being, we lack the infinite, or apparently lack the infinite, and it's in this that we feel a pull, we feel some suffering, and we think we can make this feeling go away by acquiring material possessions but what we actually need to do is realize our unity with all. Okay. What I'm wondering... Well, 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 okay, correct. Let me, just, let me just rephrase <laughs> sure. that. Well, what we really need to do is trace our way back to our essential being, whose nature is peace and happiness. I'm curious if the lack that we feel as finite creatures, or apparently finite creatures is what produces some of the suffering, or if not all of the suffering? Yes, it, it, it creates all the suffering. And by suffering, I, I mean psychological or emotional suffering. I'm not speaking of physical pain. Yes, yes, it, it is because psychological suffering is always, I don't like what is happening. It's like suffering is resistance. I'm not talking about not liking physical pain. That's something different. Uh, take the experience of, um, of jealousy. One can be in good physical health and feel jealous. So when we say, um, let's put it like this. If you've, um, if, if you, you told me the other day you stubbed your toe. You, you, good memory, and you, and you, you said, um, you probably didn't formulate it like this, but, but, you, you said, I, I don't like this experience. Now, when you say 
the, the, the I that you refer to in that case, the, the, or, or the thought, I don't like what is this experience, arises on behalf of your body. You're referring to the resistance of your body. It's an intelligent resistance in your body. When you say, um, I am jealous, the I does not refer to your body. Your body is not jealous. And now the presence of awareness is not jealous. Awareness is like an open, empty space. It can't be, it can't resist. So what, what is the I? On whose behalf is our resistance or jealousy arising? It is on behalf of an I which, if investigated, is never found. It arises on behalf of an illusory separate self or ego. Uh, or I would suggest, or, or the non-dual understanding su su suggests that, that all psychological or emotional suffering arises on behalf of a, a self which, when investigated, cannot be found as such. In other words, it arises on behalf of an illusory separate self or ego. And that is why the, 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 uh, um, the remedy for suffering in the non-dual traditions is not to try to alleviate one's suffering through the acquisition of object substance activity. It is to investigate the nature of oneself. Because if one investigates the nature of oneself and one discovers that one isn't a temporary finite separate self or ego, but is this open, empty, spacious presence of awareness, then the suffering on whose behalf, that the suffering that rose on behalf of a separate self can no longer stand because its protagonist its basis has been removed simply through understanding, through clear seeing, not because we have done anything to the separate self. There is no separate self to do anything to. The separate self is an illusion. You cannot get rid of an illusion because it's not really there in the first place. You can only see through it. So that is why this, this emphasis is placed on, on self-knowledge in, in this tradition and indeed in the West, too, the words know thyself were carved above the entrance of the Temple of Apollo in Delphi. And as such, this, this, uh, this um, suggestion to, to know oneself, this invitation to know oneself stands at the very origin of Western civilization. It is not just an Eastern attitude. When you think of this essence that is us, this awareness, do you happen to visualize it at all? Like an orb or an ocean? I know the metaphor of the ocean is frequently used, but I'm curious if you have a visualization of it or you just have a feeling of it. I, 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 visu I, I refer to it in visual terms when I'm trying to speak of it. R really, one cannot speak of it. One, one, cannot, one cannot describe it. It has no objective features. So in order to, well, not in order to describe it, but in order to try to evoke it in someone else's experience, we borrow language from, from our conventional um, discourse. We borrow language that is somehow evocative of its qualities. So we, we say, we use phrases such as the open, empty space of awareness. Well, awareness is not an open, empty space. It has no dimensions at all. But we, we cannot visualize or meaningfully speak of something with no dimensions unless it's going to be at a very uh, um, abstract conceptual level. The purpose of the non-dual understanding is not to describe reality. It is not possible ever to describe reality accurately. The purpose of the non-dual teaching is to bring us in our experience to reality, to the experience of reality. So uh, the non-dual teaching is a bit, uh, um, Picasso expressed it beautifully when he, when he said of, of art, all art tells a lie, but it points to the truth. Well, the non-dual understanding like that is like that. Nothing that is said in the non-dual teaching is true. If we want to speak about the truth, we should remain silent. However, 
remaining silent is not very effective for the vast majority of people to, um, uh, to, to bring suffering to an end. Therefore, the, 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 the non-dual, the sages of the non-dual tradition made a concession and spoke about uh, the non-dual understanding and used analogies and metaphors and uh, take drawn from everyday life, not to try to describe reality, but to try to evoke the recognition of reality in us. And hence phrases like the, uh, uh, the, 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 the luminous quality of awareness. We borrow that the sun is that which illuminates, the sun is that which renders the earth visible. Well, awareness is that which renders experience knowable. So awareness is sometimes likened to uh, um, a light or a luminosity, it, 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 only in the sense that it, it is, it, it's a knowing light. It is that which enables us to know or experience. Have you heard of Wittgenstein before? Yes, yes. He had a concept of, or there's a famous phrase of what you cannot speak of precisely one must pass over in silence. And that reminds me of that. He also had the ladder, Wittgenstein's ladder, if you heard of that, which is at yes. the end of his Tractatus, I believe he said. And all of what I told you was just to bring you up the ladder for you to kick it away because it's meaningless. The whole point of this was to show you that it, words it, can't do this justice. It, exactly, exactly. Now, some people, having understood this, decide never to speak about it because they don't want to uh, um, tarnish this understanding with words and uh, i respect that it's it's not the approach i take and it's not the approach that many other take i i'm willing to make concessions to, to to use words as carefully and accurately as i can knowing that nothing i say is absolutely true but hoping that uh, they have at least some power to evoke in the listener the experience from which they come Getting back to this lack, because there's a riddle, speaking of Jordan Peterson, he's the one where I heard this riddle from. The riddle is, what does an infinite being with infinite power, infinite knowledge, and so on, lack? And then you think, well, it can't lack anything because it's infinite, but it turns out it lacks finitude. It lacks finiteness. So in the same way, what I'm wondering, in the same way that our apparently finite self lacks the infinite and experiences some suffering does the infinite lack the finite and the infinite experiences some suffering apart from a, a sort of as a sort of semantic game i don't know how one can meaningfully speak of the infinite lacking the finite. The infinite has no knowledge of the finite by definition. If the finite, if something finite existed in the infinite, it would displace a part of the infinite. And therefore the infinite would no longer be infinite, it too would be finite. So the infinite knows nothing of the finite, and there is no question of the infinite lacking the finite. That's just a semantic game. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't relate to anything that is true. There is no question of the infinite lacking the finite. Nor indeed is it really true to say that the finite lacks the infinite because all there is to the finite is the infinite. All there is to the dreamed character is the dreamer's mind. The dreamed character in this analogy is the finite. The dreamer's mind is the infinite. So we cannot say that the, the finite lacks the infinite because that would credit the finite with an existence of its own. In the absence of the infinite, it would be like saying the dreamed character existed in its own right, independent of the dreamer's mind, and therefore lacked the dreamer's mind. 
But this is not so. The dreamed character is simply an apparent limitation or localization of the dreamer's mind. In other words, all there is to the dreamed character is the dreamer's mind. Likewise, all there is to the apparent finite is the infinite. In fact, there is nothing finite in existence. There are finite appearances. The finite only exists at the level of appearances. But what is the all appearances have a reality. They are an appearance of something. The movie you see on your screen, the movie you watch is an appearance of something. It is an appearance of the screen. And the screen shares none of the limited qualities of the movie. It is colorless. The movie is full of colors. Likewise, the, the, the finite only exists at the level of appearances. The reality of those appearances is the infinite. And this is what, this is, what, what is meant in the Bhagavad Gita, where it, where it says, that which is never ceases to be, and that which is not never comes into existence by which it, it means the, the, the infinite never ceases to be, the finite never even comes into existence. The finite is only real from the illusory perspective of the finite. The ego is only an ego from the illusory perspective of the ego. How long does it usually take people from when you explain these ideas to them? And let's say there's someone off the street, not much of a meditative background, but they're a contemplative person. How long does it usually take before they feel the insight, not just intellectually understand, but feel the insights that you're conveying? You know, Kurt, simply by virtue of the fact that all apparently separate selves or egos are, as we've just said, the infinite, albeit um, a localization of it. For this reason, everybody, everybody, not just those of us that are philosophically or spiritually minded, but everybody has deep within them some intuition of what we are speaking of here. Now, that intuition is is veiled in varying degrees depending on the opacity of their thoughts and feelings. Well, some people's thoughts and feelings are so dense and opaque that there's only, only a glimmer of this knowledge or recognition filters through into their life. But even such people, uh, such people that we would, for instance, consider to be truly evil, such people are, are capable of love. You know, Hitler had a girlfriend. Presumably he loved her. He experienced love. In spite of the fact that the, of the, the, the density of thoughts, his thoughts and feelings, only enabled a glimmer of love to, 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 to shine through and alight on just one or two people. But everybody has within them this, this knowledge or this understanding. So to answer your question or to respond to your question, how long does it take people? It, you know, it, it ver I can't answer that question because it's, some people can explore these matters. I, people have come to my meetings and retreats that have been on this path for 40 years, 50 years. And so that they, they have been, their minds have been prepared and very often because of the, the, the maturity and the, the subtlety of their mind, they, they very quickly, it's just that there was a little piece missing that just needed to be added and oh yes, of course, that, that's it. However, I've also had, and it very often happens with very young people, I've had teenagers come, in fact, um, I had an 11 year old boy once who came to one of my retreats 
in um, in California, and uh, he asked me a question. He, he's now in his late late teens. He he asked me a question, and um, uh, stupidly and naively, I thought, okay, I must um, I must water down my answer and and, and give g g give a, a, a child's answer. So I, so I gave a, a a rather childish response to what I thought was a childish question, and then and then he proceeded to. Then he said, "Is this what you mean?" And then he summarized the the previous three days of the retreat extremely eloquently in 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 about um, three or four minutes. And um, I realized that I had been wrong to presume that just because he was young and uh, um, you know relatively um, unsophisticated in his in his ideas and had never been exposed or. Uh, had not long been exposed to these ideas, I was wrong to think that he would somehow not be able to understand. On the contrary, his mind was so fresh and clear and unencumbered, not only by his own conventional cultural conditioning, but also by the, by the spiritual and religious conditioning that so many of us had to go through, um, that, that of course, in some ways helped, but in other ways obscured the simplicity of this understanding that uh, this enabled him to very simply understand in his own experience what was being said. So I, I can't really answer your question. It varies. But I just say one other thing, Kurt. I think it's only recently. Certainly it took me many, many years. And when I look back and, and I wonder, why did it take me 30 years to, to, to recognize what is so clear and obvious for me now. Well, maybe it was because partly due to the opacity of my own mind, I'm, I'm quite sure it was, but it was also because these ideas in the way that I first received them, and I went to India, not, not physically, but, but intellectually, because these ideas were packaged in, in a way that was um, not clear. The packaging, um, it was packaged in a, in, in, in a form in, in, it was an in Indian packaging that somehow um, obscured to me the real contents. And a lot of the um, spiritual traditions, uh, much of the, the, the knowledge that we hear from those traditions is nothing to do with the essential understanding. It has everything to do with the, the culture in which the understanding arose and was expressed and is actually superfluous to the understanding itself. And I think it is only relatively recently that this understanding is being expressed, divested of all the um, religious and spiritual paraphernalia in which it has been enshrined and um, I would say very often disguised. Uh, until recently, so I think this uh, this understanding is um, much more available now than it was even ten years ago, and, and available in a way that doesn't require anyone to subscribe to any uh, to a person, a guru, a teacher, a tradition, a religion. Or it's just just the the raw essential understanding is being um, is being expressed in um, just in everyday language without recourse to the Tibetan language or the San Sanskrit or, or all of these, uh, much as I love those and respect those traditions, I was brought up in the Vedantic tradition, but the, the association with the cultures in which those traditions arose uh, tend to exoticize, I'm not sure that's a proper word, is it? Um, they exoticize the understanding and make it seem like something extraordinary and mystical and, and, and from a lot of people's perspective, a little woo-woo, to be honest. It, the, the, the recognition that is being spoken of is, is nothing extraordinary. It is just the recognition of the nature of one's own being. There is, there's nothing, even the taste of tea is extraordinary compared to the recognition of the nature of our being. Sorry, that was rather a long answer to your to your question. <laughs> okay, the question comes from DIY Craft Q. Can Rupert Spira discuss the death transition that Rupert Sheldrake thinks 
is like moving into a dream state, but I think Py- Spira believes our memories disappear into the greater consciousness. And then he puts in brackets, which pretty much sucks. What's the point of all of this individual real or not identity simply to blend and mush with the consciousness blob? He means that respectfully. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I don't know if you're aware of Rupert. Schultz. Oh, yes, yes. I, I know Rupert. He's a, he's a friend of mine. Yes. Yes. Let's go, go back to the dream analogy. The dreamer imagines the dreamed world within its own mind, localizes itself within its own dream as an apparently separate subject of experience, from whose perspective it views its own activity as the outside world. So the outside world is what the activity of the dreamer's mind looks like from a localized perspective within that world. Yeah. The, the body of the dreamed character is what the localization of infinite consciousness looks like from a second person point of view. So translate that to our experience in the waking state. Each of us are localizations of infinite consciousness and our bodies are what that localized consciousness looks like, how it appears from the outside, just as the universe is how the unlocalized activity of consciousness appears from a second person point of view. So bearing that in mind, that the death or dissolution of the body would be the, the relaxation of the localization or contraction of the finite mind or separate self. The finite mind or separate self could be considered a localization or contraction of infinite consciousness, which appears as each of our bodies. Then death would be the decontraction, the relaxation, the expansion of this segment of mind that is the separate self back out into the broader medium of mind, which gave rise to it in the first place. Now, there's nothing to suggest that this uh, contraction of infinite consciousness into the form of the finite mind expands on death all the way back to infinite consciousness. There is nothing to suggest that it could not begin to disintegrate and this would correspond with the death of the physical body, but the, the individual mind could remain in some form still within the universal field of consciousness without dispersing completely into it. And it is that is what I believe although I've never heard it from him or discussed it with him, but I think that this would be what Rupert Sheldrake meant when he said that it's like entering into a dream state. It's an, just as in, in, the, in, the, in, a, in our experience, in a dream, our mind expands beyond its limitations in the waking state. At, in, in the dream state, our mind relaxes and much of the content which was not available to our mind in the waking state is becomes available to our mind in the dream state simply because our mind has relaxed and expanded and what was previously what's called subconscious outside the compass of the waking state mind now appears inside it so this could this is rupert sheldrake's analogy of um, the dream state to death as the finite mind expands on death it begins to lose its limitations. It begins to experience regions of the universal mind that lay outside its experience while it was alive, but is now 
encompassed within it because it has expanded just as our mind expands in the dream state. And in the Tibetan tradition, this is called a bardo. It is considered to be a realm. It's not really a realm. It's not a, 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 an extraordinary realm that, that, that we go to. It is always, everything is always within the only realm there is, infinite consciousness. But it is, as the mind expands, we have, uh, uh, we have more access to the content of infinite consciousness. And from the localized perspective of a separate self, we, we conceive of that as a, a realm that we go to after death. We don't go anywhere after death. We consciousness stay exactly where we are, but but we cease contracting ourselves, and we we expand. But as I said, there's nothing to suggest that that expansion goes all the way. It may it may remain, and there's nothing to suggest that it could not um, coalesce back. That it could not coalesce again and appear in this realm as a physical body interesting so i just leave that open as a possibility it would be an interpretation of reincarnation that was consistent with the understanding that reality is a single infinite and indivisible whole whose nature is consciousness so it would be a a, a more sophisticated interpretation of of reincarnation it's not really that we as individuals are born again and again and again that's a rather mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's a rather simple it, there's some truth in it but it's mixed with um it's mixed with a with a materialistic understanding it's it's a kind of it, it's a tra traditional idea it's also a new age idea and like a lot of new age ideas there's a kernel of truth in the idea but it has been appropriated by the ego and mixed with its conventional materialistic perspective and some hybrid idea in this case idea of reincarnation has resulted from it where can the audience find out more about you and what are you working on next rupert okay so the, the, the easiest place to, to, to go is uh, youtube i have an embarrassing number of of uh, YouTube clips. So that, that would be one way to get a quick, easy, free sample, my YouTube channel, Ru Rupert Spiron. Uh, I have quite an extensive website. Um, if you were interested in the more philosophical aspects of this conversation, uh, I would recommend one of my books called The Nature of Consciousness. If you're interested in the more experiential aspect of this conversation, I would go to my book called Being Aware of Being Aware, which is a much smaller, very experiential, direct exploration of the nature of consciousness. Whereas the, the book, The Nature of Consciousness, is more philosophical. And, and so those are, the, those are the two books I would recommend. Uh, what am I working on now? I've just finished writing a book now, uh, which I, I did during lockdown. Uh, it's called uh, You Are the Happiness You Seek, which is an attempt to try to make this understanding uh, available to people, uh, to, to the people that we referred to before, not just the scientists who are, who are put off by the nonsense in the new age uh, community but but who don't want to who don't want to subscribe to any religious or spiritual uh, traditions or teachers or ideas or customs who, who just want the the, the j j just want the raw truth about how to find happiness and so it's an attempt to to uh, it, first of all explain how happiness is the very nature of our being and then provide simple pathways of accessing it without any religious or spiritual paraphernalia. So that book is about happiness itself. As I suggested, the nature of consciousness is more philosophical. It's about what we've been speaking and being aware of being aware is more 
experiential. So a- any of those sources, um, take take your take your pick. <laughs> And do you have a Twitter or a Facebook page? I, or Ruth will send me all the marketing material. I do material. have a Twitter or a Facebook page. I have to confess, I, I, I literally can't remember when I last looked at either of them. I don't really do Twitter or Facebook. Um, Ruth and, a, and another, a small team of people d- deal with all of that and update it. And so, yes, R- Ruth will give you all the links to, to, to Facebook and Twitter and and. Thank you so much, Rupert. There are more questions, but you're probably itching to get going. And I appreciate that you've stayed for as long as you have. Not at all, Gerd. It's been a, it's, and I really mean this, uh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. I've thoroughly enjoyed the, the conversation and you, I, I've, um, you've made me say things that, that I'm, that I wasn't aware were inside me so it's a beautiful conversation and I'd be more than happy to perhaps we should pause now we've said an awful lot I'm sure you need to to pause too and we could resume as and when um, if, great if thank you, you, you so much I'd be very happy I, to 